Hey everybody, how's it going? I always gotta check if the uh, visuals and audio are working. Check the... Yep, looks like everything's working fine. Hello, hello everybody. Otis, Freudian, Skira Horror OB. Happy Saturday, or... Yeah, there you go. I was like, is it Saturday? Yeah, it's Saturday. I remember which day it is. Happy Saturday. <laughs> I see we have a comment about the uh, new Epic History TV Napoleon video. Don't worry, have patience. Uh, I filmed my reaction to that. It shall be up tomorrow. Okay. Um, you know, we have a stream scheduled for today. And we will be doing the scheduled reactions. Um... But don't worry, the new Epic History TV Napoleon will be out tomorrow. I already filmed it. Um, I mean, come on, you guys know me. Whenever there's a new uh, Epic History TV video, especially a new Epic History TV Napoleon video, I gotta do it as quickly as possible. Um, so, that reaction will be out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, the Memorial Day special. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how many... Americans we have in chat, but, uh, you know, if we do have any, a Memorial Day weekend. Hope everyone's having a good time. Memorial Day's on Monday. Time for your iconic welcome to the stream song. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that iconic little tidbit, eh? <laughs> oh, man. I think you changed your username from last time. Grape Crusher. Eh? Which one of you is it? Uh, Roy Dean is here to start tangents about Caesar and British food. Yeah, that's what we got up to last time. Uh, we managed to get into many tangents. Of course about Rome, of course about Caesar. Trevor. Okay, I think I could have guessed that, but there you go. Um... Yeah, we got into lots of tangents about British food last time. I think we could probably afford to not get into those tangents this time. Memorial Day commemorating the magnificent and August reign of Honorius. Not quite. Not, not quite. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty sure about 99% of Americans would have no idea what you were talking about if you listed that. Uh, hey, Shad is here. Welcome to the stream. And, you know, in a way, this stream has happened because of Shad, you know? I mean, the reason I felt compelled <laughs> to do this reaction is that last time, and every time we have a stream, I'm giving you all a bit of context for those that don't know, every time we have a stream, you know, we do reactions, and sometimes we will vote on what reaction we're going to do. And basically every time we have a vote, Shad will put forward an option, oftentimes about Asian or, in particular, Indian history, and he will lose <laughs> every single time. He will always lose. And last time he suggested, who are the Tamil people? And so, it lost the poll, but we're doing it today, okay? So, th there you go, Shad. Got an uh, offer letter from a great university and Ethan Stream on the same day. Hey, well, congratulations, Shad. That's some great news. I would say about e equally as good as me streaming today. Equally as good. <laughs> hey, but congrats. That is good news. Yeah, and we have, you know, Harry. Harry said he'd be back in five minutes, so we'll have his, his British nationalism to add to the stream. You've become quite the tyrant. This Well, the thing is, really the issue isn't necessarily my tyranny, but whenever we hold a vote, the chat always votes against whatever option Shad has put forward. I mean, unsurprisingly, you know, if we look at the sort of content I do, people are very interested in a lot of Roman history and a lot of European history. So if they have the option to choose that, they will usually choose that, which I understand. That's what the audience is interested in. But, you know, I started to feel a little bit bad <laughs> that every time Shad suggested an Asian history video, it got knocked down. It got defeated. So today, 
What we have up on the agenda is Who Are the Tamil People by Kagito. Um, that'll be an interesting one. And that'll definitely be a learning experience. You know, I, I'm going to learn a lot watching that one. We will need the contributions of the chat, in particular Shad, who, who knows a bit about this. And then we're also going to be reacting to How Did the Abbasid Caliphate Collapse? That's a much shorter video, but it's a little more related to uh, other reactions we've been doing. You know, we do a fair amount of Islamic history, and we've recently started doing some Abbasid Caliphate content, and so we're going to do that reaction too. I think that was suggested by... Was it Light who suggested that in the Discord? I don't really remember. Um, by the way, hey, if anybody's interested, you can check out the Discord. It's linked in the description down below. We talk about history. You can suggest reactions, etc., etc. It's starting to feel like a sympathy stream. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit, but also, you know, I like to have a diversity of content that we do. I don't just want to keep doing... I mean, look, I love Roman history and the sort of modern European history that we often do, and I'm fine with continually doing that, but sometimes it's good to have a bit of variety, you know? So I like to add in history from different regions around the world, different time periods, and that's what we're getting back to today. Hello, Dennis. Uh, nope, you haven't missed anything. Uh, Roy Dean wants someone to come along who requests U.S. history reactions so Shad's suggestions don't come dead last anymore. This is true. Uh, probably the only thing that this community is interested in less than, like, Asian history is American history. Y'all are, y'all are really not into that. Um, so if someone was to suggest American history videos, then yes, they probably wouldn't get very many votes either. Which is why sometimes I gotta, you know, I gotta add stuff in on my own volition. I mean, I like to listen to what the community says, but at the same time, sometimes I gotta make those executive decisions to, to get something a little different in there. Oh, <laughs> Trevor asks, what is the scheduled IRL historical reenactment stream? Oh my goodness. That would be quite a shift in content, I have to say. Quite a shift in content. Petition for August to become... Like, Roy Dean, I don't think we need a Roman History Month. Every month on this channel is Roman History Month. You know, we always have some sort of Roman history going on. I mean, we've had the uh, the Hannibal series by History March going for a while. And uh, I sort of stopped for a bit. But now we're back to doing it every week or almost every week. And though it doesn't do so well views-wise, I'm committed to finishing that Hannibal series. We're getting close to the end. Um, and plus, there's so much Roman content we haven't done yet. Um, I mean, yeah, we've got so many videos planned, so many other live streams planned. Uh, although I will say, one live stream I want to do at some point in the near future, because uh, I really enjoyed the Roman Emperor tier list stream. Streams, actually, multiple streams. I think at one point we're going to do a American President's tier list because, you know, if we're talking about any sort of leader, emperor, president, whatever tier list, I was like, okay, what else can I actually do? What am I familiar with? And I was like, U.S. Presidents, I can do that. That's sort of, that's a fun tier list. People, people enjoy that. So we're going to be doing that at some point because I think those are a lot of fun. So, and then, you know... Shad says, Roman senator tier list. Like, I can't... Like, how would you even do that? That is... There's just so many people you could include. Um, I just don't have the base of knowledge to do something like that. Um, and there's a couple of other, you know, tier lists. I mean, there's like... The thing is, there's something like, you know, greatest generals tier list. But that is so broad. It becomes a little difficult, I think, uh, to do something like that. Though, that's an idea we could do in the future. I think Roman generals tier list is a good idea. I think we'll do that at some point. It's a little more specific. So I do think we'll do Roman generals tier list. <laughs> Trevor says war tier list. <laughs> yeah, just a tier list of wars. You know, how exactly do we rank that? What are we judging based on? Um, but yeah, I think in terms of tier lists... 
Uh, I think the Roman history, or sorry, we did the Roman emperor tier list. The, the U.S. president's tier list will be the next one, and then we can do other ones in the future, because tier lists are pretty fun. Uh, Hussein says, I discovered you through your reaction to Islamic history videos. I mean, if you look at the channel, really, our three buckets are Roman history, Napoleonic history, and Islamic history. Those are our three most popular categories, and it ain't even close. So, you know, the community overall really likes Roman history, and it really likes sort of modern European Napoleonic, and I think there's actually a lot of crossover there. Um, but we also have a significant portion of the community who is very much into the Islamic history, and that's what brought them in. Uh, U.S. history crying in the corner. There's a lot of history we haven't done. Lately, we've been doing some more Asian history. That's something I wanted to expand into. Uh, we have done maybe like three videos on U.S. history. Um, I remember we did uh, one on like the end of the Mexican-American War. And we did uh, one on Tecumseh. And the Tecumseh videos didn't get very many views, but I thought they were interesting. And then we haven't really done, I'm trying to think, I don't think we've done any African history aside from sort of North African history and how it relates to Mediterranean and Islamic empires. Um, and then we haven't done any Latin American history. There's a lot of stuff we haven't done. There's a lot of stuff we haven't done. Epic history, Napoleon drama, let's go. Is there drama? Hello? What is that referring to? I don't, I have not heard any, any drama in relation to epic history. <laughs> yeah, light, light gives us the colonialist perspective. <laughs> European history is African history. <laughs> yeah. And Dennis points out Historia Civilis in particular. I know a lot of our um, Roman history fans came from the Historia Civilis videos. He really does a great job giving them little color squares, a personality. The comments on your Napoleon epic history video should give you an idea. Okay, I feel like I'm being set up in a trap here. I, I mean, I guess I'll wait to see, but... I mean, I, I watched, I already filmed a reaction to the Epic History TV new Napoleon video, and I thought it was pretty good, so, <laughs> I don't know what the, uh, what, I don't know what the drama is. I'm being told there's drama. I have no idea what it is. Yes, and is always pointed out when we talk about his story, Civilis, I think the, the one thing is that he really doesn't like Octavian, like, he has a personal beef with Octavian, I think. And, of course, that becomes... Oh! They're talking about the... Oh, thank you, Light. They're talking about the extra history drama. That's what happens when you have extra history versus epic history. <laughs> okay. I was completely off. I thought y'all were talking about the new epic history TV Napoleon in Italy video, but y'all are talking about the extra history Napoleon in Egypt series. Oh, now that clears it up a lot. That clears it up a lot. Sorry, y'all were y'all were saying EH, and I just since I've just done I just filmed the reaction to the epic history TV Napoleon in Italy video, the new one. I was like, I didn't know there's drama about that. What are you guys talking about? But you're talking about the Extra History TV, or Jesus Christ, the names are similar. You guys are talking about the Extra History series on Napoleon in Egypt. Got it. Um, yeah, so the, like, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's really drama, because I'm going to be honest, like, if you look at their videos, they're doing well. If you look at their comments, people seem to enjoy them. Um, it's just, in the reaction I've released so far, there were a lot of comments about how people didn't necessarily love the new Extra History Napoleon series. They said it, it was biased or inaccurate. 
Um, you know, that, that sort of stuff. I think people were arguing that it was biased against Napoleon. Now, I've only watched part one and part two. So I, I really don't know. And to be honest, I didn't think part one or part two were all that bad. Um, maybe one, maybe it'll get worse. And two, I know a lot of people are very passionate about history. I think my objective is a little more sort of removed slash objective. Um, but maybe it'll get worse throughout the rest of the series. I don't know. I, I, as I always do, I'm going to give the videos a fair chance. I'll give my commentary. And then I, you know, I'll look at the comments and see what they say. That's how I approach it. And that's how I'll approach the Extra History Napoleon in Egypt series as well. Um, because, I mean, I have my own opinions on Napoleon in Egypt. I don't think it was, <laughs> like, a glorious conquest, the top of his career. Like, I think there's absolutely stuff to criticize. So, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. Um, do I like VTH Chris? Yes, I do. I enjoy his videos. Uh, vlogging Through History, another history reaction channel. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know the guy, but he seems like a cool guy. <laughs> he has good videos. Uh, he knows, seems to know what he's talking about. So yeah, uh, I think he seems like a cool guy. Wrong. Napoleon invented Egypt. <laughs> and then, you know, Roy, so, you know, some people are, I, I think, frankly, I mean, I'm not saying there aren't legitimate criticism of the new uh, Napoleon in Egypt series. There absolutely might be. What I am going to say is a lot of people are big uh, Napoleon fans, and they get upset if you level any criticism against the man. So there could be an element of that. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. But you know, I, I literally haven't watched the whole series, so I can't judge. <laughs> yeah, good idea, Dennis. History student reacts to his own search history. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I mean, Napoleon in Egypt is pretty interesting, you know? I mean, there's a lot of stuff to say. There's the campaign itself, there's the military aspect, and then what I find, honestly, even more interesting is the long-term effects. You know, the sort of Egypt craze that emerged from it. There's a lot of fascinating stuff, uh, but that is totally off-topic. We should uh, probably get to what we're doing today, which is... Who are the Tamil people, and how did the Abbasid, Abbasid Caliphate collapse? And you know what? I think what we're going to do... I'm going to put up a poll on which one we should watch first. So we're going to do both. But I'm putting up a poll, because I think polls are fun. Uh, and y'all guys can vote on which reaction should we do first. Do y'all want to do Abbasid Caliphate first, or do you want to do Tamil people first? <laughs> and I, I mean, we'll see what wins, but... Look, Shad can't lose, because we're going to do the Tamil people video. But it would be a little funny to me if he lost this poll. <laughs> In terms of what we do first. Yeah, Otis wants us to do two videos simultaneously. That would go fantastic. What a great idea. Skira Horror Obe says, Napoleon is one of the emperors ever. He is one of the emperors ever. Uh, look, hey, Dennis, dumb jokes is a very worthwhile value add to the stream. I'll tell you that much. That is like half of what we do here. You know, half is legit history, half is dumb jokes. All right, uh, we've got 15 votes and we have 15 concurrent viewers. So I'll, I'll give it a couple of seconds. It looks like Shad has lost. I mean, I've got to be honest, I knew he was going to lose because he always loses, it's destined. And I, I will say, to take some personal responsibility, I think the fact I said it would be funny you know, made it so that he would lose. <laughs> yeah, Light says, now you said it. it would be funny he lost. You just made it so, Ethan. This is true. This is true. Napoleon is an S-tier French emperor. Yeah, well, good pointing out, Roy Dean. There's not much competition. 
Uh, all right, we're ending the pool now. <laughs> we're doing... We shall be doing Abbasid Caliphate first. Sorry, Shad. Well, it's okay. It's okay. Don't don't feel too bad for Shad. Uh, we'll be doing the Tamil people video in this live stream, and the Abbasid Caliphate one is is less than ten minutes. It's a short one, so it should only take us about you know five hours to get through. <laughs> And, you know, once again, it's just, I know what the community likes, and if you give them an option between any sort of Asian history, or like, you know, in this case, Indian history, or Islamic history, they're gonna go with the Islamic history. Yeah, D Shad, we're saving the best for last. Think of it that way. Think of it that way. All right. All right. It feels like it's time to sort of get into this. Uh, where is... There we go. <laughs> I'm, like, scrolling through the scenes on OBS. Ah. Shad, you are getting your way, my man. You're getting your way. <laughs> we'll, we'll be doing the Tamil people after this. Yeah, and like all like all Rome fans, whenever we do Islamic history, we always have to talk about the Byzantine Empire. It's inevitable. We do it every time. Um, or I always bring up the Sassanids. Yeah, I feel like every time I do an Islamic history reaction, there's always reference to the Romans and or the Sassanids, even though the Sassanids, you know, been gone for a long time at this point. So what we've been doing lately... Um, we've been continuing the kings and generals uh, early Muslim expansion series, and they are getting close to the beginning of the Abbasid Caliphate, and then we did that newish epic history TV video on the Abbasid Caliphate, on the rise of the Abbasid Caliphate. So now, <laughs> we're doing the collapse of the Abbasid Caliphate. In a couple of years, Ethan will react to the tragic history of Shad's suggestions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it's, someone, I think someone could literally make a compilation from these streams. The tragic history of Shad's suggestions. <laughs> you know, his suggestions every single stream and how they basically get shut down every single stream. Uh, okay. I think we're going to jump right into it. Y'all can let me know if the volume is too quiet or too loud or whatever. Um, I should be able to see that as well. And we're jumping into How Did the Abbasid Caliphate Collapse by al Mukadima and Nalajia. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember if I've reacted to any of their videos on stream, but I've seen both of these channels off stream a little bit, a little bit. So let's go. On 9th of August, 833 CE, Al Mamun died. Usually, with someone like him, a powerful and stable ruler, he would expect his son. Oh, hello. Back his son to succeed. It's the the power of Shad. He's he's ddosing my internet. He doesn't want this reaction to happen. His son was indeed a great military commander. He had the competency, but he didn't succeed Al Mamun. Al Mamun was instead succeeded by his brother, who came to be known as Al Mutsim. And there was one reason behind this: the Turkic mercenaries. <laughs> My goodness. This is a fast moving video. Is the whole thing gonna be this this quickly done? Wow. Should I I feel like I should read all of this. Okay, what 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 is happening here? As Al Motsin, and there was one reason behind this. The Turkic mercenaries. Alright. <laughs> Uh, this seems, okay, this seems irrelevant. Maybe this is just an intro. Okay, that's the intro. I was gonna say, like, what are we, what is going on here?
During Al Mamun's reign, Al Mutasim had been in control of a private army of Turkic nomads from the Eurasian steppes. Al Mamun had used them in various military campaigns. One of the biggest advantages that the mercenaries had was that they were loyal to gold, so they could help tip the balance of power in the empire in the caliph's favor. The caliph didn't have some of his early videos, so the quality is not that great. Yeah, I'm sort of already noticing that a little bit. Um, and what I'll say about Turkic nomads, uh, they could be a very effective military force, but to be honest with you, you know, watch out. Because <laughs> if we're talking, you know, we're talking about the beginning, not the beginning, but the lifetime of the Abbasid Caliphate, we're getting a lot of Turkic nomads moving into the region and uh, having a pretty big impact on the region, frankly. You know, taking over, doing a lot of damage to some of the established states. So you gotta watch out a little bit. ...to rely on his vassals anymore. It was because of this force that al Mutasim took control of the empire after his brother's death. This probably looked like a good idea at the time. A similar thing has been tried throughout history and it has worked exactly zero times. Because <laughs> those mercenaries usually come to the realization that the emperor needs the mercenaries more than the mercenaries need the emperor. The Turks mm. started taking over the establishment. This broke up into many conflicts with the older Abbasid bureaucracy. And al Mutasim even founded a new city, Samara and took his Turkic establishment there. Turkic influence kept growing even after al Mutasim's death in 842 CE. al mutawakkil tried to get rid of them. He even had two of the most powerful Turkic generals arrested, but the Turks, along with his son, who was angry at not being the heir apparent, plotted his assassination and eventually killed him in 861 CE. This was effectively the end of Abbasid power. From then on, all Abbasid caliphs were puppets of one Turkic general or the other. This period wow. is known as the Anarchy at Samara. Eventually, al mutawakkils grandson did move the capital back to Baghdad, but it didn't change much. The yeah, I didn't know that these uh, Turkic mercenaries had such a high degree of, you know, I suppose, unofficial or de facto power within the Abbasid Caliphate. I mean, like I just mentioned, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, you have a lot of Turkic migration into this area, a lot of Turkic nomads who will begin to take over the region, establish their own bases of power. Uh, you know, skewer horror joke, Seljuk moment earlier. Of course, the Seljuks are a big part of this. And then, you know, even more. I mean, if you want to go even further down the line, you have the Ottomans. So this is something we're moving towards, but also... Light points out armies that are not loyal. I've never heard of this shocking concept. Yeah, that's the thing with mercenaries. Look, they could do a good job. You know, sometimes you need mercenaries. But there's this idea that, and it's true, I suppose, that, you know, mercenaries are only loyal to the money. But if you so desperately need mercenaries and they have other options available, then they end up sort of holding the leverage in that position and you can end up in a lot of trouble. You know, these mercenaries are supposed to be serving you, but you end up under the control of them. It's a dangerous position to be in. Answer that al Mutasim had exposed the Caliphate to had completely taken over all aspects of the empire. A position of Amir al Umara, or commander in chief, was established for the Turks. The Abbasids continued to lose territory. They lost all of Arabia, which broke up into various tribal entities. They lost Egypt, which was taken by the Talanids, their former vassals. Their clients, Taharid in Persia, were overthrown by the Safarids, who even threatened Baghdad itself. Syria broke up into independent entities early on, but was later cannibalized by the Egyptian Talanids. The Abbasid Empire had shrunk to a quarter of its size. The Yikes. There was a brief period of recovery from 892 CE to... And here we get the sort of breakup of the Islamic world. It all splits in several different directions. <laughs> Ptolemy comeback when? Yeah. Yeah, that's, surely that's going to happen. Surely. <laughs> it hasn't been, you know, if we're around 833, it hasn't been surely more than 800 years since the Ptolemaic dynasty, has it? Uh, all this fighting, but where's the Roman counterattack? Roy Dean is upsetting spaghetti. Well, I mean, to be fair, during this period, you know, Rome sees uh, an uptick in power, reclaims some of its lost territory, and the part of that is due to the Islamic world breaking up and sort of losing its center of power, and it does give Rome an opportunity to reconsolidate its position, but 
I mean, come on. Rome is is never going to reclaim most of that lost territory. It just it just ain't going to happen. Rome does not have that level of resources. Also, a lot of this territory is so completely foreign to it at this point. It's just not going to happen. Sassanid comeback when? Yeah, that's even even less likely. <laughs> I mean, the Sassanids are long, long gone. Just completely gone. Heresy from Ethan as usual. Bar barbaric talk. Yeah, the, Ro the Roma booze cannot accept the truth of the situation. <laughs> the Roman Empire is long past its peak. Though, like I said, the Byzantine Empire is consolidating its power at this point. Um, so, you know, it is reaching, I mean, not its peak, but like sort of a, a peak, you know, a point where it's uh, a little more powerful. Ethan pretending he's not a Roma boo. Well, I, I use that, uh, you know, I use that derogatorily. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big Roman history fan, but... I don't think I necessarily have the same sort of personal connection that a lot of our Roman history fans in the chat do. I'll put it that way. Uh, anyway, that that's sort of our, I, you know, as always, we instantly go back to Rome whenever we're talking about Islamic history, but that, that's sort of the deal with Rome at the moment. Uh, who was the Roman Emperor at that time? Oh, honestly, I could not tell you. Uh, I do not have that, uh, that that timeline in my brain. Maybe somebody else knows in chat or can look it up. Roman Emperor around the 830s? Uh, I do not know. Around 904 C, who managed to bring quite a bit of former Abbasid land back into their control. However, the empire was internally plagued by the same issues. Discontent among the lo local dynasties was growing. During the next 40 years, the Emir al Omara kept installing and deposing caliphs. Abbasids kept losing and gaining territory. Instability was at its worst. The caliphate even alternated twice between the same two caliphs for a while. Former Abbasid vassals that paid lip service to the Abbasids kept growing in control. Eventually, in 945 CE, a dynasty from the Elam defeated the Abbasid army under the command of Tuzun, the Emir al Umara, and marched on Baghdad. For the oh. first time in 300 years, the Caliph was a vassal of another ruler. The Buids replaced the Turkics as the puppet masters. They became the protectors or Sultan of the. Uh, from some brief Googling, it appears that from 829 to 842, Theophilus was the Byzantine emperor. So there's your answer, Dennis. Theophilus was the emperor around this time. Though I'm not sure exactly what year we're at at this point. We might be a little bit beyond Theophilus. The Caliphate. The Caliph usually kept control over the capital city of Baghdad. This was usually done with the help of a certain group of ruffians called Ayarun. These were a class of warriors which served as local gangs, taking advantage of the in increased instability due to the Shia Sunni tensions. These mm. Shia Sunni tensions had been fueled by the rise of the Fatimids in Egypt and North Africa by 1960. Right. Yeah, and then we, you know, we talk about the split Islamic world. This is a real interesting thing. I mean, you know, I'm not a scholar of Islamic history, and what I do know, I mainly know about the early caliphate, but the we have the rise of the Fatimids in North Africa. That's sort of an interesting alternative base of power. Of course, you have the continuation of the Sunni-Shia split, um, which is, you know, a real interesting thing, sort of a religious difference that, well, a religious difference that was always a political difference, and then over time, really split into a serious, or actually, I've got it flipped. It's, well, it's both a religious and a political division, but initially, it's more of a political division, and then over time, it morphs into a seriously deep-set religious division, uh, as it is today, you know? Fatimid Caliphate was the first Shia state. Huh. <laughs> Sultanate in Rome when... <laughs> Yeah, of course, we're all we're all waiting for, and I released a, a short about this, 
We're all waiting for the successor to the Roman Empire to appear. The Ottoman Empire! Hey, hey! No, I mean, I don't, I don't really believe that. But, you know, there is some chatter about, you know, you have, you've got Rome, and then you've got Byzantium, which is just Rome, and then after Byzantium, you have the Ottomans, and they, they're the continuation, uh, or the successor to Rome, which I don't think is true. But some people believe that. I mean, some, you know, there's this big guy, a lot of people want to claim Roman legacy, you know what I mean? I mean, there's this big idea amongst Russians that, you know, Moscow is the third Rome because of that orthodox connection. So, you, you know, you look around the world, frankly, and you got a lot of different states that are like, hey, we're the next Rome, we're the successor to Rome, etc., etc. Uh, the true successor to Rome is Brazil, <laughs> says Shad. Come to Brazil! <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, everybody knows you've got the full Roman Empire, you've got Eastern Rome, and then you've got Brazil. That's what comes next. Uh, of course, there's a bit of a gap in between the fall of Constantinople and the establishment of Brazil. But, you know, Brazil really picks up where Constantinople left off. Who is claiming the Abbasid legacy? It's for sale at an auction. This is true. Uh, who is claiming the Abbasid legacy? I mean, I think the Abbasid legacy sort of folds into the broader, like, Islamic legacy or the legacy of the Caliphate, right? And, of course, you have uh, several different states and groups today that would claim to be the Muslim Caliphate. Um, so, that, you know, I think it's more like that. I mean, it's sort of similar to, maybe not from our perspective, but from the Russian perspective, they say Moscow is the third Rome. That is merged with Orthodox Christianity. I mean, that's why Moscow is the third Rome, because it is the, you know, new center of Orthodox Christianity after the fall of Constantinople. So it's sort of interesting how people view these sorts of legacies and how it gets tied up with religion. You know, fascinating stuff. Come to Brazil and all roads lead to Rome. Connect the dots. <laughs> they had taken over Egypt, making Cairo their capital. A lot of people in the Abbasid realm had sympathies for the Shias. Also, the Buids were Shia themselves. At this point, the Shias weren't exactly an entirely different sect as it is now. It was mm. mostly just a political division. The faith systems themselves weren't very different. This is true. This is true. Now, it was sort of a religious difference, but I think it's accurate to point out, like I said, initially it is more of a political division, um, but over time it really becomes more and more of a religious division. Uh, and nowadays, when we look at the Sunni-Shia divide, we first and foremost see it as a religious split. And then we see it as a political difference because, you know, even today, if we look at the politics of the Middle East, the Islamic identity, Shia and Sunni, plays into the geopolitics of the region. But, you know, we still see it as a uh, religious split when at this point it is a little more political in nature. It would have been nothing out of the usual, except the Fatimids also called themselves caliphs. The rightful ones, since Shias believe the caliphate should have stayed in Ali's descendants, and right. the Fatimids claim descent from Ali and his wife Fatima, Muhammad's daughter, from whom they got their name. The Shia caliphate was doing great at a time the Sunni one was in decline, so naturally a lot of people were starting to align their sympathies with, with the Shia caliph. So. It's funny how these caliphs want to emulate Muhammad like the Roman emperors emulated Augustus. Well, it's interesting because I find it fascinating if you look at, say, someone like Muhammad versus someone like Jesus. Of course, within Christianity, a lot of people want to emulate Jesus, but Jesus was never the leader of, like, a state, you know? So it's uh, a little bit different. But if you look at Muhammad, of course, he is a religious leader, so you want to emulate him in that way. And then he was also the caliph, you know, he was this military political leader. And so, you know, they want to emulate Muhammad for religious reasons, but also for like practical political reasons. I think it's a really uh, interesting mix, I think. Look at what they need to do to have a fraction of Augustus's power. Sure. <laughs> I mean... Yeah, the Roman Empire has fallen, and uh, they're really, you're not going to find a state that holds all that territory. 
You know, we, we, we're past that era. Everything's split up, you know. It's a multipolar world. The Abbasid Caliph Al-Qadir published the Baghdad Manifesto. It was basically like a mini medieval birther movement. The Caliph got many genealogists and scholars to prove that the Fatimids were indeed not Fatima's descendants, but rather, in a shocking twist, were descendants of a Jew, which were considered an <coughs> enemy of Islam itself. Meanwhile, the Fatimids were like, I'm sorry, I... Okay, but is that like proved or like proved? You know what I mean? Genealogy. I mean, you know, I respect genealogy. It is a legitimate field, but uh, if we look at genealogy throughout history, not always the most positive uses, and oftentimes it is, just like history, is twisted to make a particular point. So, when they say, I don't know if they mean they proved it, or like they proved it, as in, eh, that's the argument they made. It's pretty difficult to measure genealogy that far back anyway. We've reached the era where big conquest is too hard due to every city having walls. This is true. <laughs> uh, yeah, and once again, you know, we see the Jews sort of having a bad time. That association with the Jew was apparently a real negative thing. Um, it is interesting. I mean, I, my mind always goes to this because I think it's a little interesting factoid. And this is, you know, a couple hundred years uh, after this, but I always think about the Reconquista, right? The Christian Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula and how they either pushed out the Jews and Muslims or forced them to convert. And a lot of those Jews who fled from the Iberian Peninsula, a lot of those Sephardic Jews, the Sephardim, fled to the Ottoman Empire. Isn't that interesting? The Ottoman Empire of the time said, hey, all you Jews who are fleeing from Iberia, come to our empire. We'll, we'll welcome you. We'll welcome you. Um, so uh, that's an interesting tidbit I always remember. And they, they resettled them around Constantinople. Uh, the whole Jew ancestry thing was propaganda. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. Uh, and uh, Yeah, I mean, Jesus was a Jew. Uh, I mean, there's an interesting... <laughs> This gets into more of the Christian side of things. There's a sort of interesting relationship between Christianity and Judaism where it's like, well, Jesus was a Jew. But then, and of course, like the early Christian history, if you want to call it that, or stories are very much intertwined <laughs> with the Jewish people and the Jewish religion. But then there's been a lot of Christian discrimination against Jews since Christianity arised, you know, and there's this whole idea that, you know, the Jews killed Jesus and there's a lot of animosity there. So it's a, an odd relationship. Do the religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity worship the same God? Yes, they do. They worship the, the one and only God, whether you call him God, Yahweh, Allah, you know, he's the same, he's the same God. It's the God of the Abrahamic faiths. You know, our, our three religions of the book, um, which is why they have such an interesting relationship, because they are three different religions, but they have that connector, right? <laughs> so why are they all fighting? Oh, Roy Dean, my, my poor, naive young man. <laughs> why are they all fighting? Oh, it's like complex history with i mean look you could ask look at history hey why are there so many christians fighting other christians you know everyone's fighting always doesn't matter if they share the same god or they even share the same religion there's always conflict to be had especially if we're looking at religion for the most minor of disputes or disagreements or even if there really aren't any disputes or disagreements there's always conflict to be had Trevor says, also the idea that Christians are serving God better than the Jewish people. Yeah, you probably know a bit about this, Trevor, because, I mean, these days, the sort of Christian-Jewish relationship is pretty good, but I imagine amongst more evangelical Christians or, I don't know, you know, good old American Baptist, they might have some particular opinions <laughs> on the Jewish people.
Yeah, there's big there's, there's big disagreements on the prophets and, and that sort of business. Jews think that Malachi was the last prophet. Christians think it was Jesus. Muslims think it was Muhammad. And yeah, Roy Dean, I might have to speak for the next thousand years to answer that question. Can't hear you over the sound of my armies conquering Syria and Palestine. Meanwhile, in the year 1040 CE, an Agios Turkey clan from the Eurasian steppes had just defeated the, the Ghaznavids in the Battle of Dandanakan. In 1055 CE, Doğril Bey captured Baghdad from the Boids. Some say. <laughs> yeah, y'all can. <laughs> I'm muted my mic. Y'all can hear my dog downstairs. <laughs> yeah, my dog heard that we were talking about religion and she couldn't help but share her views. Yeah, you don't want, I mean, you don't want to know, frankly. <laughs> Show the dog. The, the, the dog is, the dog's probably barking at someone uh, coming home or something. Free the dog. She's freed. She's freed. So three different religions who worship the same god fighting each other, and inside these religions they fight each other, sometimes splitting off to make smaller groups inside said religions. Uh, check, check, check. Yes, this is exactly what happens. Look, I think... I mean, there's a couple of ways to look at this. Like, and by a couple, I mean there's a lot of ways to look at this. I think, um... I mean, sometimes you just come down to the question of, like, is conflict inevitable? But to take it uh, maybe a little not quite as deep as that, I think there's something to be said about dogma, right? Being dogmatic, not to make a dog pun. <laughs> but what I mean is, whether we're talking about religion or, say, a dogmatic political belief or any sort of dogmatic belief, a doctrine that one must follow and obey all the tenets of, you know, this can lead to just a lot of infighting and conflict because if you have that sort of dogma, if there's any sort of disagreement, any sort of difference, then first off, immediately you're on a different page and immediately it often escalates to, you know, serious disagreement or even violence. So I think, in my opinion... Uh, all the religious conflict. There's a lot of different reasons, and I think a lot of times religious conflict is just basically, like, political conflict masked with religion, frankly. You know, if you look at a lot of religious conflicts, there actually end up being a lot of more material reasons. But I also think it has something to do with sort of uh, just how inflexible dogma or dogmatic beliefs or particular doctrines can be. And like I said, that mostly refers to religious doctrines and political doctrines. That's what I think. The other and Trevor Trevor points out sort of a, uh, I'd say a different example, God, gold, and glory. But I still think, you know, that that is a particular doctrine, a very different one from a different time period. But But yeah. The request of the Abbasid Caliph himself. Dohril Bey's brother, Chagri Bey, married his daughter, Khatun Khadija, to the Caliph. This was done in the hopes that the Caliphate and the Sultanate would merge through their son. This didn't work out. Another Sultan later tried the same with his daughter, but that didn't work out either. Uh -oh. Things were pretty good over the next 40 years. Oh. The Caliph ran. Okay, things were pretty good. <laughs> they were like, ah, it didn't work out, it didn't work out. Things were pretty good. All right, great. And Magma asks, how is a 15, but 10, by the way, how is a 10 minute video not over yet? I don't know. We're doing pretty good. Uh, we're, <laughs> no, we're not. We're not doing pretty good. We're 50 minutes into this stream and we've done five minutes of this reaction. That's probably about as slow as we normally are. Uh, now look, Magma, this is just how the stream happens. You know, we, I, I mean, look, it's a pretty small chat, so I'm willing to engage basically every chat message. And uh, we usually enter into uh, a variety of tangents. And, and Magma's kidding. We, I've seen Magma in chat several times. Uh, but yes, this is very true. We take a long, long time. <laughs> Zods is here. Hello. Yeah, Roy did. Very true. <laughs> you have both missed... 50 minutes of talking, but you've only missed five minutes of the video. So you could interpret how much you've missed from, uh, from that. 
and the religion and the Seljuks ran the empire. It was a pretty good partnership, except the Seljuks had just started kicking the Byzantine gates. In 1071... Uh-oh. Roboboos, Roboboos, get worried. I mean, look, things have already been, frankly, bad for the Byzantine Empire. They ain't getting better. See, Ala Parcelan defeated the Byzantines with basically no effort at the Battle of Manzikert. The Byzantines couldn't resist the Turks anymore. Turkic tribes started settling in the previously Byzantine region of Anatolia. Oh, look at all that territory lost. Look at all that territory lost. Like I said, bro, when the Turks arrive, they're doing serious damage to the whole region, including, honestly, I mean, the biggest, um, I mean, the biggest victims of this are the Caliphate, whichever Caliphate we're talking about at that moment, and the Eastern Roman slash Byzantine Empire, which, you know, will fall to Turks. It will die to Turks. Eastern Roman Empire. Did he just say the B word? I've talked about, you know, I use the term Eastern Roman and Byzantine interchangeably because people use both, and a lot of people understand Byzantine more than Eastern Roman. I find it fine to use both. I know that, yeah, this is uh, Al Mukadima. Um, pretty good channel, I think. It's getting bizarre, one could say. <laughs> both a Byzantine joke and, like, a also a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure reaction. <laughs> Why do I hear holy music? Uh oh, what's happening? <laughs> Emperor Alexios called on the Catholic Church to help curb the Muslim expansion, and in 1095 C, Pope Urban in the Council of Clermont declared a crusade. There we go. We have the the Crusades, as uh, what is it? Bill Wirtz, I think, put it. You know, what did he say? It was like they almost all didn't fail, or something like that. <laughs> Most of which almost didn't fail. I don't remember. Um, we've done uh, part... We didn't finish it. But we did that Kings and Generals series on the First Crusade. And uh, the First Crusade was probably the best performing crusade. But, of course, overall, not very successful. Not great long-term consequences. Sacked Constantinople. Ended up not being great for the Byzantine Empire. <laughs> we have <laughs> Deus Volts in chat. Deus not Volts. Oh my goodness. For whoever, for devotion alone, goes to the Temple of Jerusalem to liberate the Church of God can substitute this trip for all penance. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty encouraging. What do you mean probably the best? Well, that, that's what I mean. It was the only one that was actually successful. That's what I mean by the best. It's the only one that was actually successful. Yeah, and we have non-Christians yelling Deus Volt in the chat. Odd. Very odd. <laughs> very odd. <laughs> and then Light shouts out, Peter the Hermit. What a, what a mess. I mean, I know, uh, and Trevor will get this, I know Roman's a big Peter the Hermit fan, but... Not, you know, a Roman in particular, my buddy Roman. But uh, Peter the Hermit, what a disaster. Free my boy Peter the Hermit. He's done nothing wrong. Peter the Hermit has done everything wrong. He led a band of peasants tramping through Europe where basically what they did was just <laughs> mess with a bunch of cities, really cause a whole lot of trouble, and then didn't even achieve anything in the end. Oh my goodness. Peter Gothicus, that's very funny. Peter Gothicus Hermitus, that is a, that's a good history joke, like, I think a lot of people would not get that, that's funny. Yes, Walt, God fills in. As you might expect, the Muslim Pope, the Caliph, suddenly had a relevance boost when he helped rally the Sunnis to the cause of defending the Holy Land. Well, more Anatolia than the Holy Land. In 1099 CE, Jerusalem fell to the Crusaders.
Only successful crusade. There you go. <laughs> it's done from that point onwards. For the next 50 years, the relationship between the Abbasids and the Seljuks fell apart because the Sultans thought the Abbasids were interfering too much in matters of the state. The empire mm. itself wasn't stable. Many princes and other Turkic dynasties around the empire were contending for the throne. It was the time for the Abbasids to take advantage of this. In 1125 CE, al Mustarshid was it powerful enough to build an army and rebel. However, his rebellion didn't go far. They met the Seljuks right outside Baghdad and were defeated. al Mustarshid. Yeah, I just saw this in chat from Light. Here's a controversial question. B-C-A-D or B-C-E-C-E? Uh, I don't really care. I'm going to be honest. I, I, I mean, I don't even think it's... I don't even know why it has to be a controversial question. I know some people... This is what I say about... Some people take history very personally. Some people take the question of BCAD or BCECE -E very personally. They get very heated about it. But I, I, I honestly couldn't care less. Uh, I understand why there's been the introduction of BCE and CE. Uh, I think it's probably more appropriate, more objective. Um... You know, what I mean, more appropriate to use in a historic context. So, uh, I'm fine, but I just don't really care. It, it doesn't bother me that much. I will use either... I mean, I will usually, when I speak, I'll use BCAD, because it just comes more naturally. But it doesn't really bother me either way. <laughs> like, I prefer ACDC myself. <laughs> Yeah, BCE is more historic, BC is more religious. Um, yeah, this is true. Doesn't, it just, but I think this is accurate. Uh, BCE, CE is, uh, yeah, it's just more of an objective way to put it, I suppose. Um, but I don't think it makes much of a difference and uh, it doesn't really bother me too much. So I don't know. I don't get too heated about it. Yeah, I mean, all it is is different names for the same thing. Um, one of those names is just more religiously based. And one of the names in, is just more an objective sounding term, I guess is the best way to put it. You know, Zods is clearly invested in the ADBC. I don't think it matters. It really doesn't matter to me. I know the, like, academia... And written history is moving towards uh, BCE and CE. So that's probably the direction we're heading. But that, I mean, doesn't really bother me at all. Uh, nah, you didn't really miss anything important, Dennis. We're now, uh, Light brought up the whole topic of, uh, you know, BCE and CE versus uh, BC and AD. Which, once again, I don't think it's much of a, not of an important distinction. <laughs> yeah, we could go back to using the Roman style of years, which is instead of using numbered years, we just say, in the years of the consuls, <laughs> funny, the consuls Julius and Caesar. Um, yeah, the that that's certainly an easier way of doing things. Just remember each year by whatever political leader is in charge. was put under house arrest. His son similarly was hostile to the Seljuks, so much so that they deposed him and he fled to Isfahan and was killed by the assassins on the way there. Finally, in 1157, al muqtafi once again declared independence. This time, he was able to fight back and defend his realm, freeing oh. it from the Seljuks. After 200 years of occupancy by foreign powers, the Abbasids were independent. Over the next 50 years, the Abbasid Caliphate managed to secure most of Iraq. However, the worst threat the Caliphate had ever faced was coming. A force unlike any the world had ever seen took over most of Eurasia. By 1227 uh -oh. CE, the year of Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan's death, the Mongols were standing at the gates of Persia. They had taken over most of China, the Eurasian steppes, Genghis Khorasan, Khan. and even Persia. Genghis they had defeated Khan. the once mighty Khwarezmid Empire that had filled the vacuum left behind by the Seljuks. In 1258 CE, Hulagu Khan laid siege to Baghdad the heartland of the Islamic Golden Age. Halagu had Ooh. demanded submission from the Caliph, which- God damn, look at that empire. Look at how far west they've made it. Yeah, they were, they're really shaking up the region. The whole region's getting shaken up with the arrival of Gen good old Genghis Khan. 
I know Extra History has a Genghis Khan series that has been requested several times, frankly. I know some of y'all want to see that. Maybe we'll do that eventually. I don't know. I'm not making any promises. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, Mongol throat singing in the background. Which the Caliph ill-advisedly refused. Halagus sought to make an example out of the Caliph for this insolence. According to some sources, Al-Mustasim didn't think it was an invasion, and rather just another raiding party, many of what which the, the Caliph... Islamic region again. Yeah, this is true, Kevin. <laughs> New challenger approaching. <laughs> Kings in General series is better for Genghis Khan, my goodness. It pushed back. On January 29th, the siege of Baghdad began. The Caliph reportedly neglected to put a proper force together, reinforce his city's defenses. Not that it would have made any difference. According to some sources, Halago Khan asked for all of the city's elite, the aristocracy, the scholars, the engineers, and the bureaucracy all of them to come outside the city for negotiation. As around mm -hmm. 3,000 of the city's elites went for negotiations, they were all murdered. On February 10th, Ugh. the city surrendered. The Mongols went on to massacre the city and its population. Some 200,000 to 800,000, or maybe even a million people were killed. Jesus Christ! A couple hundred thousand people killed, and also, I mean, we're talking about Baghdad at this period, a real population of elites, scholars, all that sort of business. I mean, we know uh, Baghdad really was an important city, so you're really <laughs> losing a lot of life and a lot of value in that moment. The stench of the dead bodies was so bad that Halagu didn't stay in the city for long. The survivors said that the waters of the Tigris ran black with ink from the enormous quantities of books flung into the river. And red <laughs> from the blood of the Jesus. scientists and philosophers killed. Oh, well, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah, we're tossing all the books in, so the water's running red from ink. And it's also, or sorry, running black from ink. The water's also running red from all of the scholars and scientists that we've murdered. <laughs> what, uh, what an appealing sight. <laughs> Such a waste to kill those people. Think of all the taxpayer money they lost. <laughs> yeah, that's the main concern here. Think of the taxpayers. Come on now. Oh, man. It was so thoroughly destroyed that even today, no signs of the core city, the circular city of peace, have been found. The caliph was killed. The Mongols feared spilling royal blood, so he was rolled up in a carpet and trampled by horses. The end of the Abbasids in Baghdad. However, one of the Abbasid princes was given refuge by the Egyptian Mamluks. He Yeah, y'all are pointing out Mamluks won a battle against the Mongols. We have uh, the, the Mamluks playing a role here, which is interesting, because obviously we've been thinking a little bit about the Mamluks lately, since we've been watching Extra History's Napoleon in Egypt series where he's been battling the Mamluks, though, to be honest, he's more battling the British, the environment, <laughs> you know, lack of water. Those are much bigger threats than the Mamluks in, uh, you know, the late 1700s into the early 1800s, to be honest with you. He and his descendants held the title of the Caliph, only in name for the next 300 years. In, five, in 1517 CE, the Ottoman Sultan Salim Yavuz invaded Egypt and took the title of the Caliph for himself. Almost mm. a millennia after Muhammad's death, the title of the Caliph went to someone outside Muhammad's tribe, the Quraysh. Yeah, yeah. See you next time. Oh, there we go. Man. You know, we should really do some uh, some Ottoman content at some point. I'm a big... Uh, well, not necessarily a... I, I like the Ottoman Empire, you know? It's been a while since I've read up on the Ottomans, but I have done a bit of reading on them in the past. Um, I think it's pretty fascinating, you know, the history of the Ottomans, the amount of power they gained. I also like, you know, to look at their conquest of the Balkans and then them holding the Balkans and then all slipping away. I think it's a real interesting region uh, and time of history. Yeah, and we, we finished the video. Only took us uh, about an hour. Though, we did talk for like 50 minutes beforehand, and, well, I have no excuses. I mean, it took us about an hour to finish a video <laughs> that was 10 minutes long, but, you know, it's not, could be worse.
Ottoman Empire overrated to the Mughal Empire. I mean, look, I can't compare between the Ottomans to the Mughals. Because um, I don't know enough about the Mughals. But I don't think the Ottomans are overrated. I think I, I like the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I think it could, you know, I mean, we haven't given it any attention or almost no attention on our channel. So I would definitely like to do more Ottoman content. And plus, it's more, I mean, you know, it's just what I find interesting, basically. It's not more complicated than that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the Ottomans are overrated, but you could argue that the Mughals are underrated for sure. I think they're far less known than the Ottomans, at least in the Western world, which is all I can speak for. I mean, we don't talk too much about the Ottomans, but we know a little bit about them. All right, so we will be moving on to uh, who are the Tamil people? This is going to... It's a 26-minute video, so it's probably going to take us like three hours, if I had to guess. Oh, a donation, a sticker. Thank you, Brian. I very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. That is our... I think second donation ever. The first one was like the first stream or something. Um. <laughs> yeah. Brian has contributed to, <laughs> to my food budget. <laughs> oh, look at that. We got, we got the alert coming through a little bit later. Well, at least I know the alerts work now. I don't think I've ever had a chance to use them before, so that's fun. Ethan, stop indulging every comment. Cease responding to everything immediately. And what if I don't, huh? What if what if I keep responding to every comment? What are you gonna do? Yeah, that's right. You have no power here. <laughs> Look, I mean, we have a pretty small chat. You know, I I can respond to every comment. That's sort of how we do things. You know what I mean? Uh, if the stream ever gets a little bit bigger, then. I'll have to probably stop responding to every comment, but for now, for now, that's what we do. <laughs> Ethan the Terrible. Yes, my, my tyranny begins. My tyranny begins. Shad wants to overthrow me because every time we do a poll, he loses. <laughs> Not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. Um, impeach him. Kevin, after I modded you, you've done this to me. My mods are turning against me. Can't wait for his Nero era. <laughs> Ethan the Delayer. I like that title. I like that title a lot. I mean, <laughs> you could ask Trevor. Ethan the Delayer. Seems appropriate. Um, okay, then. Okay, why don't we... St we'll stop delaying. We'll stop delaying. And we'll go to who are the Tamil people. Now, this is a good question. I believe. Dennis wants to, oh, see. I you know we've got some we've got some backlash, some support. Zod's terms me Ethan the Great. Dennis shall appoint me as puppet king, and order me to go on more tangents. My goodness. Okay, so now we ask ourselves the question: Who are the Tamil people? This is a good question because I know absolutely nothing about the Tamil people. I got to be honest. I really got to be honest. You know, we have been moving into a little more Asian history lately. We've done a little bit of Indian history, mainly because Shad really wants us to do it. But my base of knowledge is still, like, basically zero. So uh, this is going to be a, a learning reaction. And um, anybody in chat, I think especially Shad, can let me know more information on what we're hearing here. Um, and, and I think that'll be good. So, who are the Tamil people? Let's learn. This video is sponsored by... B this both video videos. By Curiosity Stream. Get access to Nebula, a video streaming service made by your favorite educational creators. Nebula. Everyone loves Nebula these days. Uh, there's a lot of educational creators on Nebula. Uh, you know, everyone, everyone's promoting it these days. Tamil control of the sea trade from Asia to Europe is underrated. It was even more precious than the Silk Road at one point. 
Huh? Okay. Now that's that's quite the statement. That's quite the claim. Not to mention they had the most contact with Rome. The most. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Can we get a reaction to Ethan mining a stone quarry in Skyrim for 10 hours? <laughs> Yeah, that would be... Just imagine me mining stone in Skyrim for 10 hours straight. All the tangents we could get out of that. That would be truly painful by... Well, honestly, probably by like the third hour. Or maybe the first hour, I don't know. The first embassy from India to Rome was from a Tamil king. And Zod says, let's remember... Shad is Indian, and you know how those Indian nationalists are like. Whoa, okay. I didn't say it. Zod said it. He's he's lobbing the accusation at Shad, implying that he may be unreliable due to his national origin. I would never say such a thing. Um, I, 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 I hold Shad's word <laughs> in high regard. <laughs> All right, anyway, let's get into it. Curiosity stream using the link in the description. This is South India, home to the biodiversity hotspots, the Western and Eastern Ghats, the Bengal Tiger, the Nilgiri Tar, the Indian Elephant, and whatever this creature is. Here is- Shad, what was that creature? Tell us please, some type of frog. Also the cradle of Tamil culture. Today, there are about 80 million Tamils in the world. Huh? More than there are French, Colombians, or Kenyans. Yeah, get out of here, French, Colombians, and Kenyans. What the hell, 80 million? My goodness. Most Tamils live in North and East Sri Lanka or in the Southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu, literally Tamil country. Tamil Nadu is now a state in modern India, but for thousands of years, Tamilikam, or the homeland of the Tamils, was much larger and ruled by independent kingdoms. Mm. Tamil culture is the last surviving classical civilization because they've managed to keep their beliefs, culture, and language intact for over 2,000 years. Wow. So who are the Tamils? What is their story? I don't know. What does it have to do with $700 billion golden coconuts? Holy... Those are some expensive golden coconuts. All right. I'm excited to learn about the Tamils. You know, a clearly a very long-running culture, a numerous people group today with a long history and a lot of wealth involved. So I'm excited to learn. I really am. Well, let's find out. Gogito. Curiosity visualized. The Tamils, maybe more than any other people, are in love with their language. Tamil writing really? has been dated as far back as the 6th century BCE, from the archaeological okay. site Kairadi in India, and from the 2nd century BCE at Punakari in Sri Lanka. No matter what nationalists tell you, Tamil is older than Sanskrit and is still spoken. Wow. Tamil older than Sanskrit. That's pretty damn impressive. And still spoken today. My goodness. Seems like a really long-running, continuous culture. Making it one of the oldest datable languages still in use. Tamils often call their language Tamartai, which means the Tamil mother. Mm. It's more important to the Tamil identity than land, race, or religion. If you want to have the most intense conversation of your entire life, just go ask a Tamil person anything about the Tamil language. Tamils also take pride in the independent origin of- I'm starting to see why it's not a good idea to react to Indian history- WHAT THE HELL CHAD?! This is all you ever wanted! You can't turn back now! We're doing it! We're doing it! We've got 25 minutes or something of this reaction left. Which means, yeah, you know. Probably, a, a, like, two hours of this video left. Some people talk about Tamil as the oldest spoken language in the world, but I'd rather say it's the oldest still-spoken language. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a very... Yeah. I mean, I can't make absolute claims. I just don't have the base of knowledge. But it seems like Tamil is a very old, one of the oldest sort of continuously spoken languages, uh, which is very impressive. Um, and seems like... You know, unsurprisingly, if you know that, then you know that this culture has continuously survived for a long ass time. Not their language. See, you can roughly divide India linguistically in half. 
North Indians genuinely speak languages descended from Sanskrit, an Indo-European language. Mm -hmm, this language mm -hmm. family stretches from North India all the way over to Iceland. South Indian languages like Tamil belong to a completely unrelated language family called Dravidian. Huh? Unlike Sanskrit, Where did Dravidian come from? Which, like Latin, is no longer spoken, modern Tamil survives as a living language for millions of speakers. Dravidians do not like it. Whoa, they're making a statement here. This is a political statement from Kagito. Hindi, never, Tamil, forever. My goodness. When North India tries to push its culture or language on the south. The earliest clear evidence of Tamil people are urn burials dating from around 1000 BC at Adich Anilor. Amazingly, they found evidence there of the worship of a god with a trident and a peacock, very like the Hindu Tamil's favourite god today, Murugan. But the Tamils really leap into world history when the Maurya Emperor Ashoka mentions the unconquerable- Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> the Tamils really hate Hindi, understandably so. What, you know, ethnic and linguistic tension within India? I've never heard of that. What's going on? <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. There certainly is... Well, I mean, like, there's there's ethnic tension world worldwide. It's not an unusual thing. You, you look at a lot of different countries, you find some degree of ethnic or linguistic tension, you could call it, or conflict. Well, southern Tamil kingdoms in his rock inscriptions made between 273 and 232 BCE. Which is impressive when you consider the fact that the Maurya Empire essentially conquered everything else. This ah, is right yes. around- Yes, except the Tamils. You know, the whole Tamil kings joke that everyone loves to reference. <laughs> yes, yeah, so true, Ashoka. The Tamils are overpowered. <laughs> so true. The beginning of a Tamil golden age known as the Sangam period, lasting from the 3rd century- Sangam period. Wow, that's a... That's quite a lengthy golden age. 300 BCE to 300 CE. Uh, don't let Zod see this. He's going to be upset that they're using the newer <laughs> version of dating. Um... But despite that, that's a 600-year golden age. That, that, that's fairly lengthy. That's quite an era of presumably cultural flourishing and prosperity. BCE to the 3rd century CE. At this time, Tamilicum was ruled by three Tamil dynasties. The Solas, the Seras, and the Panjas. Unfortunately, there were no actual Pandas in uh -huh. the Panja kingdom. I know. That's funny. The Tamil kings were immeasurably rich and used their wealth to sponsor century-long poetry slams. <laughs> Light asks us, what does golden age even mean, lol? Well, you know, it's a bit of a vague term. I mean, we have some things associated, right? The flourishing of a culture, economic prosperity, but beyond that, it's uh, kind of a broad thing. Uh, the only Indian civilization to really venture out of the subcontinent. Interesting. I wonder where they ventured. Maybe we'll find out. Presumably to Rome, considering there's communication there. <laughs> Golden Age means they aren't fighting a civil war. <laughs> I mean, you have you have the, you know, general Golden Age. You know that your civilization is important or well-known when you get your own specific term. Like, you know, we had one for the Tamils, or we have the Pax Romana, or a lot of you Brits like to talk about the, the Pax Britannia and all that sort of stuff. Um, that, that's how you know a culture is remembered, or at least is very much up its own ass. <laughs> Either one of those, I guess. Called the Sangams at the Panja capital, Madurai, where male and female poets would show off their works. These poets created thousands of poems, books, and epic stories called Sangam literature. Damn, okay, so they were spitting. You know what I mean? They were, <laughs> they were dropping bars. I respect that. I respect that, especially in ancient times. That's very respectable. Uh, it seems like and the Tamils, the Tamil kings were super rich due to trade. Yes. I mean, that's the one thing that we know about the Tamil kings, uh, mainly because it's referenced in the history of the entire world, I guess. So everybody knows that little tidbit. <laughs> the Honorius Age. <laughs> Sangam literature is unique in how it doesn't seem to belong to any single class or religion. It was written by and concerns Hindus, Jains, men, women, farmers, kings, pandas, non-pandas, and everyone huh? in between. 
One great singer, poet, Poon Koon Kriner, emphasized... Okay, he did not pronounce... How, how is that supposed to be pronounced, Shad? I definitely feel like that was not pronounced correctly. We can, uh... We, we can... Try and relive that pronunciation. And everyone in between. One great singer, poet, Poon Koon Kriner, emphasized the equality of all humans, saying, I am a citizen of the world, and everyone in the world is related to me. Well... I mean, uh, technically true. You know, we are all related to each other in one way or another. This was quoted by one of India's most beloved presidents, the Tamil Muslim aerospace... Pungun Dranar. Dranar. Oh, well, maybe he wasn't too far off then. I don't know. Scientist Abdul Kalam at the European Parliament in 2007. The Sangam literature... That was... <laughs> also spoke at the Europe That's not 2007! <laughs> ...in Parliament in 2007. Is it? The Sangam literature... Tells us about a rich cosmopolitan oh, that was like a while ago. ethnic Tamil speaking society 2,000 years ago, where Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism all coexisted peacefully, where kings would even invite priests to public debates on their beliefs. Sangam poems describe Madurai as so rich that it had a moat with secret underground passages large enough for elephants. What? Mercenaries God damn! Elephants. Uh, yeah, I, Brian, I, I agree. Um, I mean, we like to talk about warfare and military affairs, and I get that. I mean, I like it too. Um, I think to a lot of people it's very exciting, though I am more into, like, political history. But uh, I think it's nice to have... Uh, and, of course, you know, there's military involved here, but it seems like their main thing was trade. And that's really how they spread their influence and their culture, uh, which I think is uh, interesting and sort of underrated. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to make a moral judgment. But I think a lot of times we put a lot of focus on the military side of things and maybe don't give enough attention to stuff like trade, commerce, industry, all that sort of business. You know, economic history doesn't get the same amount of attention, um, but it's very important as well. And the scent of perfume could be smelled miles away from the city, where there were folks of every race buying and selling in the bazaars or singing to the music of wandering bands. So how were the Tamils so rich? Yeah, wait a minute. How are these guys so rich? Trade, I assume. Ethan, moral imperialist confirmed. Unconfirmed. Not confirmed. <laughs> Literally invaded Indonesia and kidnapped their king because he tried to mess with their trade. My goodness. They were serious about their trade. They were spicy. The ancient world was a bland, flavorless, unseasoned mess. <laughs> it sounds like Britain today. <laughs> Tasted a lot like English food. <laughs> I didn't even need to have to make the joke. They made it for me. Oh my goodness, I'm so right. A lot like English food. I didn't even need to say it because Kagito was going to say it for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great timing. <laughs> I haven't seen this video before. I have not. That is. And I think the, the guy narrating this video is Irish. So I think we both we both innocently just went for a jab against the UK. <laughs> oh, that's great. That is great. Yeah, we won't get back onto the British food tangent, but I just, I couldn't help myself. And clearly, Kikito couldn't help themselves either. This was until the Tamils taught everyone the way of the spice. <laughs> A 1st century CE Greek manual for sailors, the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, says that the Tamils export pepper and... Okay, we're not going to go into the same tangent again, but I will just address two comments. First off, on a food from a nation that puts melted cheese on Chinese food, we... I, I, I've never seen melted cheese on Chinese food. Uh, no, don't believe everything you see on TikTok, I'll put it that way. We ain't putting not... You know, it is not a common thing to put melted cheese on Chinese food. And then, look, okay, Ethan pretending he ain't British. You know, I am from the UK. I identify far more as Scottish than British, first off. But unfortunately, I've been... I mean, I don't know, you know, it, it's all in good fun, but I'm pretty Americanized at this point. And look, if we're talking about food in particular, then I'm not going to rep Britain in terms of food. I'll, I'll rep Britain in terms of other things. <laughs> not food, though. That is British, bro. Well, we don't want to get into this, Zods, uh, but, uh, you know. You know. I mean. 
you talk to different Scottish people, you'll get different opinions on the sort of British identity. I'll put it that way, okay? That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, you know, I won't represent the entire country. Of course, some Scottish people are very uh, comfortable with the British identity and they identify as British. But first off, most Scottish people would identify as Scottish over British. And then you do have some Scottish people who would not identify with this British identity at all. But, you know, well, I won't speak for everybody. It's a sort of complex picture. I don't feel too attached to either, necessarily, but... Uh, does Dutch food have any reputation? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Uh, maybe some of our European viewers will have... I don't know, heard of some reputation about Dutch food, but from my perspective, I don't think Dutch food really has any reputation. And other spices, along with diamonds, woven textiles, pearls, ivory, malabadrum, and other luxury items. What's malabadrum? Who cares? It sounds luxurious, though. Huh. Another major export was cotton and silk clothing woven by women. Shad says Dutch food is British food, but worse. Holy... That's that's offensive, I think, to the Dutch. Jesus, is it that bad? <laughs> I don't I don't even know what Dutch food is, really. I don't know what y'all be eating over there, but uh, that, that's pretty bad. Indian women would dominate this global trade for the next two thousand years. Tamils traded so much that Pliny. Americans hate that we put mayonnaise with fries. Uh, I haven't heard that, but it doesn't. I mean, it's a little strange, but it doesn't. It doesn't send me into a rage. Uh, I, I probably wouldn't put mayonnaise with fries, but they put chocolate on white bread without toasting it. Like, do you mean like chocolate spread like Nutella or do you mean something else? Like, hmm. Skewer Horror OB Ob says mayonnaise on chips is great. We've got a, a mayo with chips slash fries fan here. I mean, I've never had mayonnaise with fries. I probably wouldn't, but, you know, doesn't, like I said, doesn't send me into a rage. Uh, like chocolate sprinkles. Oh, chocolate sprinkles on untoasted white bread, did you say? Huh. That's odd. Okay. Intra curious. <laughs> That's, uh, hmm. Okay. I wouldn't do that, but, you know, whatever. Um, Choco spread on white bread was my breakfast yesterday. That, 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 that's fine. Sprinkles popular here, too. Huh. I didn't know y'all were so into sprinkles. All right, anyway, off the food tangent. The elder said, India take Pliny? What the hell? Okay, I need to focus back up. When do we get to Pliny? Woven by women. Indian women would dominate this global trade for the next 2,000 years. Tamils traded so much that Pliny the Elder said India takes 100 million sesterces from mm. our empire per year at a conservative Ooh. estimate. That's about My goodness. 10 tons of gold. China had the Silk Road. The Tamils had the Flavor Highway? Uh, no, let, no, let's not call it the Flavor Highway. I, that's not a good name. <laughs> we can think of something better than that, surely. Uh, yeah, oh, no apologies, Dennis. I'm just, I'm getting sidetracked with the, the food debates again. The Spice Boulevard. Whatever. Eh. They made themselves the center of a global trade network that linked Europe, the Middle East, Africa. And yeah, and I, I want to pause it. Look at that network. And it really, I was, I find these sort of interesting because it sort of reorients our view of the world. I know that from, well, okay, a couple of things. From a sort of Western perspective, right? When we look at a map, we often look at the Mercator projection, which really centers Europe in the middle of things. And so we will often look at the world from that perspective. And then if we're looking at Roman history, we'll sort of center everything around, of course, Rome, the Roman Empire. And, I mean, I think that makes sense, but I do think it can be good to orient your... Uh, geographic perspective at times. It gives you a different perspective on history and all, all that sort of business. And so I always like something like this, looking at maps of the Silk Road, 
or in this case, what has been labeled the Spice Boulevard, <laughs> where we can see, you know, we have our, you know, our channel's favorite Roman Empire all the way to the west, sort of off at the frontier of these trade routes. And we can see these routes linking sort of the central point of India with, you know, all throughout Asia, China, East Asia, South Asia, through the Middle East, um, you know, into Ethiopia, Arabia, uh, you know, through Greece, you know, the Persian Empire, into Rome. It's just really interesting to see all these different regions linked through trade and communication and culture and all the things that would spread through those sort of trade routes. <laughs> yeah, Crassus with 200 million sesterces. And then Roydian gives the counterpoint, Crassus <laughs> dying by having gold poured down his throat. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, different, you know, there's pros and cons with Crassus. Didn't end up super well for him. Spice is basically oil of the ancient world. Yeah, spice was a really important international export. And frankly, you say of the ancient world, but spice would continue to be a very important trade good, trade good up until pretty damn recently. I mean, when we think about our, you know, sort of modern European colonialism of the past couple hundred years, spice and the spice trade was a big motivator for all of that. So spices have really been important throughout history, frankly. Yeah, and Shad makes the typical UK joke. Uh, you know, Britain invades half the world for spice and then refuses to use it on their bland food. India, Southeast Asia, and China. We've discovered massive hordes of Chinese, Iranian, and Roman coins along the ancient Tamil coast. Tamil inscriptions have been found as far apart as Egypt and Thailand. A statue of the Hindu goddess Lakshmi got buried at Pompeii. And Tamil hmm. ambassadors met with Augustus Caesar in 20 CE. Wow. This trade made Tamil How about that? the first international cuisine in the world. The word orange comes from the Tamil naran. Ginger comes from... Oh! Uh, hey, hey, slow down. I want to see that little chart again. The little graphic. The That's fascinating. The Tamil naran. Well, we took a big jump from the naran to, to orange, which is Old French. But I think in Spanish, orange is anaranjada or something like that. I forget. It's been a while since I've done any Spanish. But, you know, you see the Spanish is much more similar to the Arabic. And then the old French, unsurprisingly, is similar to the modern English world of orange. So that, that's just a fascinating influence, a language influence that has really spread worldwide. A cuisine that has spread worldwide. Really interesting, really interesting. Ginger comes from Tamil Inchiper, and rice in loads of European languages comes from the Tamil Ar Yep, riso, the Italian risotto. Yeah, wow, fascinating. Look at all these words that came from Tamil and that are now worldwide. Risi. Without the Tamils, Ireland's greatest contribution to world cuisine, oh, the God. spice bag, would not exist. Yeah, the Honestly, spice bag. I knew we were going to get you got an Irish cuisine reference. I know our narrator here is Irish, so he took a jab at the British earlier, and now he has to promote the, the Irish spice bag. I don't want to live in that kind of world. One Roman cookbook had over 300 recipes using Indian spices from ostrich curry to tasty peppered brain sausage. Mmm, yummy. <laughs> another laxative. Ah! Link to the cookbook is in the description. What the hell? Tamils got so rich off of their trade routes that just one temple, the Patmana Pasvami Temple, whose vaults were recently opened, has a... Narrator is as biased as Livy. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, that level of bias and that level of equal importance, of course. <laughs> treasure worth over $700 what million. What the hell? This was accumulated over My goodness. thousands of years from the donations from Tamil dynasties like the Seras, the Panjas, the Palavas, and the Solas. Some of the things in the temple include this golden Mahavishnu statue, tens of thousands of gold coins, a solid gold throne, golden elephants, a five meter long diamond Jesus. necklace, and my personal favorite, a 30 kilogram solid gold coconut. <laughs> At what point does that stop being a coconut and start being a bowling ball? Yeah, I think that's a bowling ball at that point. God, they were rich. 
Uh, Shad's excited. <laughs> what kind of comment is that light? <laughs> Not even George Washington himself was worth 700 million. <laughs> what? Yeah, the famously wealthy George Washington. <laughs> That's what he's known for. <laughs> Golden Iron Throne. Wow, look at all that gold. Ah, uh, yes, he he did. Well, I think Washington's teeth, if I if I remember correctly, they were actually probably like wood and ivory and like stuff like that. So in reality, no, I don't think he did have uh, golden teeth. Uh, there's a lot of like speculation about that. There are still unopened vaults in this temple, so we're still unsure of how much it's worth. Tamil merchants, monks, and craftspeople worked across Southeast Asia and lived in small communities there. Tamil merchants didn't just trade pepper with Southeast Asia. They traded the spiciest thing of all. Ideas. Uh-oh. Ideas? Oh, no. Everything's going downhill. We have ideas being traded across the globe. Nothing can be more dangerous, everybody. <laughs> Uh, wood, animal, and slave teeth. Yeah, that's what George Washington's dentures were made out of. Not, not really so glamorous. Pretty gross and sort of horrific. <laughs> How many golden coconuts is Ethan YouTube channel? Uh, well, you know, like point zero 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 one percent of a gold coconut. However many zeros you need. Ideas spreading is what killed Rome. Uh, I don't think so. Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, ideas spreading can be very dangerous to established power structures. The established status quo. You know, that's why a lot of these power structures throughout history want to restrict the spread of ideas. So, you know, keep that in mind. Yeah, light is contributing towards my future... Uh, golden coconut. <laughs> the 4th century CE on, kingdoms from Thailand to Vietnam to Indonesia were ruled by Hindu kings and wrote using Tamil writing. Modern Khmer, Javanese, and Thai scripts all descend from the Tamil Pallava script. Wow. The greatest monument to this cultural exchange is the originally Hindu temple of Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Look at that. That's beautiful. My goodness. That is quite the construction. Yeah, it's what killed France's monarchy. Yeah, you get, I think that's a fair one. The spread of ideas seriously contributed to the collapse of France's monarchy. Uh, the spread of ideas have contributed to the collapse of many systems throughout history. <laughs> Light. I thought it said JavaScript. <laughs> yeah, the, the modern coding language. <laughs> Straight line directly from Tamil to modern JavaScript. Of course, of course. I still can't get over the fact that an Irish guy is talking about Indian history. I mean, I'm an American guy, and I talk about all sort of history all the time, so... Eh, it's not that crazy. <laughs> how did... Now, now, Secure Horror is asking the right questions. Now, how does this affect LeBron's legacy right here? <laughs> how does the spread of the Tamil language and the construction of this... Uh, amazing palace affect LeBron's legacy. We all need to have a think about that. <laughs> Cambodia, the largest religious structure on earth. By the end of the 13th century, we even find the Tamil Hindu temple dedicated to Shiva all the way over in the Chinese part of Qingzhou, where huh? a small Tamil community lived. The wealth and fame of the Tamil lands invited more than just merchants. A small Jewish community could be found in Kochi in the 6th century BCE. What the? That's crazy. It's truly international. And Roy Dean brings up another meme. How does the fall of Constantinople lead to the creation of anime? That one's more of a direct line, you know? I mean, if you can really point to just about anything in the modern world and draw it back to the fall of Constantinople, because, you know, you have the fall of Constantinople and the blocking of trade from the East and the age of exploration and colonialism, blah, 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 blah. So, really, most things in the modern world, if you really wanted to, you could point back to the fall of Constantinople and draw some sort of line, uh, however ridiculous it may be. More even came as refugees after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, 
and wow. according to local tradition, the Jews were followed by St. Thomas, the Apostle of Jesus, who landed in India in 52 CE and started wow. converting people to Christianity. What the dude? Thomas made his way to India. <laughs> Thomas started converting people. What the hell? That's crazy. The existence of history led to the creation of this channel. This is true. <laughs> the fall of Constantinople led to Ethan creating a History Student Reacts YouTube channel. <laughs> Julian the Apostate going to India could be a funny documentary series. Yeah, let's do a... <laughs> let's do a new HBO show about, you know, Julian the Apostate going to India and having wacky ancient adventures. <laughs> From Thomas, India's current Syrian Christian community claims descent. In wow. 629 CE, a mosque was built by Muslim merchants in Muziris. And wow. And still go visit it today, or... A part of it, at least, because the Portuguese blew it up in 1504. But like, God damn, Portuguese! Come on, guys, they were, you know, tramping around, mostly around Asia, picking up spices and blowing up mosques. Apparently, it is crazy how sort of international this region of India became. No, that is not a W Portugal. <laughs> That's just not a W Portugal. Just blowing up a religious building elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's funny, Light. Uh, did the Greeks not inform the Indians that they were operating outside of the known world? <laughs> I made this critique in another reaction. Like, the term known world is a little silly. And I know people point out, oh, known world from this perspective or that perspective. But it's not like, I don't know. I think the term known world is a bit silly, in my opinion. <laughs> I'm starting to think history is connected and one event affects another and can lead to other events. Hmm. Almost like there's some sort of causation. How strange. Why does history destroy history so often? I mean, yeah, what you're really asking is why do people destroy history so often? I don't know. Uh, a lot of different biases, hatred, fear, you know, fear of knowledge. There's a lot of different reasons why people destroy history. But unfortunately, throughout history, people have destroyed the history, the creations, the writings of other people pretty frequently, which is a pretty unfortunate thing still cool you can still see some of it okay so we're going to do a little time jump here let's see time jump they play Buddhist warrior tribes Jainism and Buddhism take over for a bit mm -hmm. Rise mm -hmm. of the Kalava mm -hmm. dynasty Hindu revival ah. oh we're going real far forward we're going real far forward here it is after the Sangha period the next great Tamil golden age happened under the Sola dynasty okay Shad's excited now that looks like Chola to me but I guess it's Shola, or what do you say? After the Sangha period, the next great Tamil Golden Age happened under the Sola Dynasty. Sola, is that correct? Sola Dynasty? Between the 9th and 13th century. Their greatest king... Whoa, okay, we are, we've gone way forward. Way forward. Uh, and Shad's excited to see the Solas in action. Asharaja Sola rose to the throne in 985 CE. He and his son quickly turned his modest kingdom Whoa. into an empire. That yeah, that's more than a modest kingdom at this point. My goodness, look at that. They they expanded. It's hard to find any close pronunciations in English. Okay, okay. Conquered most of South India, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. The Sola used their massive navy, the largest in Asia at the time, to control the trade routes between Southeast Asia and China. When the Sri Vijaya Empire threatened to block Sola access to the Straits of Malacca, the Solas launched massive naval attacks across Indonesia. Damn, Africa. they they slapping them. What the hell? They they whooping them. <laughs> and Malaysia, and even kidnapped the Sri Vijaya king. And no one ever messed with their trade routes ever again. Damn. Along with an army containing 60,000 war elephants, the Sola king's personal guard included the Paddy Muglir, or women bodyguards. I think... I feel like Shad mentioned this before, or this has been mentioned before. Trained in Tamil martial arts and weapons. 
There are also mentions of women working as advisors and ambassadors, and using their own money to make large donations to temples. Raja Raja Sola poured his enormous wealth into building massive temples in a style called Dravidian architecture. The most well known of these being Hey Dravidian! Again, once again, the emergence of Dravidian. The Raja Raja Jaiswara Temple in Tanjavur. This 66 meter tall Soren monument. Okay, Raja good. Raja I was gonna say meters. <laughs> Sorry, I need American units. But then we got the most common American unit. Measure it by Danny DeVitos. So that's 44 Danny DeVitos. That's pretty remarkable, I have to say. Sh Shad would like to. He's started his essay on the invasion of India. Or, Jesus, Indonesia. Uh, he started his essay on the invasion of Indonesia. <laughs> was one of the tallest buildings in the world at the time. Other than Rajavaja Temple, other Sola slash Dravidian architecture is also breathtaking like the Iyara Teswara Temple, the Kanki Konta Solapuram Temple, and the Champa Karesuvarara Temple. You know, I give good, great respect to this Irish man uh, who is making his best effort to pronounce all of these words, maybe getting some right, maybe butchering others, but he, he's really giving it his best shot. <laughs> Sola temples also acted as banks. These temples received massive donations from the royals, and then they offered loans from those donations to farmers, villages, and merchants. Solid. Oh no, we've got we've got Zod's going. He he wants to write an invasion, uh, an essay on the invasion of India. Don't get him started again. Oh no, <laughs> the grand old architecture did have more visual charm to it. My apartment complex and surrounding houses look kind of dull. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I I sympathize with that. I think uh, I mean look, there's a lot of different eras of architecture throughout history. And uh, I do wish that we would construct things today, just that were grand or beautiful for the sake of being beautiful. Um, <laughs> of course, Light shouts out classical art. I like classical architect architecture a lot. Um, you know, a lot of architecture is cool. I like a nice bit of classical architecture or neoclassical. Um, you know, some Victorian architecture. That could be fun at times. A little spooky, a little gothic. Um, I'm a fan of what in America we might call colonial architecture, um, which I think in Britain might be called more like, uh, Georgian architecture. It's pretty popular here, you know, your old colonial brick houses. Um, you know, I, I, I do like building things that specifically look nice and serve some sort of function. Uh, okay, so Shad. Basically, it was considered almost heretic or heretic in Indian culture and Hinduism at the time to have naval invasions outside the subcontinent. That's one of the reasons why many Indian kings didn't expand beyond the subcontinent. The concept was called Kala Pani, uh, Blackwater. Like, you would be doomed if you ventured beyond the subcontinent on the seas. So the Solans used some loopholes or outright ignored those rules. Okay, interesting. So there was this belief... Uh, it seems like a cultural and almost like religious or spiritual belief that one basically could not have an invasion outside the waters of the subcontinent. But then the Solas said, nah, screw that. We're going, we're going further. We're doing what we want to do. I'm a fan of the empire style of the Napoleonic era. I respect that. I respect that. <laughs> Roy, in our discussion of what sort of architecture we like, Roy Dean has advocated bringing back mud huts. Yeah, let's let's bring Europe back to you know average medieval surf status. <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I don't want to bring back any previous era of history. I don't, I don't want to bring back the Victorian age, but you know, I do like a bit of Victorian or Gothic architecture. Um, I mean, I went to the University of Pittsburgh, and they have this big tower, the Cathedral of Learning, which is this sort of massive show of, like, gothic architecture, really. And, you know, I always thought that looked pretty cool. Uh, so I like that kind of thing. Or, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm from Scotland. Uh, I, I was, uh, I grew up around Glasgow. Glasgow has a lot of gothic-style architecture. Um, you know, and the necropolis, you know, a lot of cool stuff there. So, you know. I, I like these sort of old styles of architecture. 
just v visual building styles, obviously with modern safety standards, of course, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like those sort of old styles or repurposing old buildings um, instead of just tearing them down. I mean, truly, I never liked the demolition of old buildings, especially if, you know, I mean, like I said, I think there's some aesthetic value if something looks nice or sort of serves a role in the community. Well, just repurpose it. Don't don't demolish it. That's always sad. Demolishing an old grand building. Brian's favorite is making things out of mud since it keeps the room cool in the day and warm at night. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to <laughs> Yeah, we're we're working purely practically, then we can practically build a a mud hut. Uh, I think maybe we have some more modern modern styles we could go for. <laughs> peasant aesthetic. <laughs> yeah, the, the medieval peasant aesthetic. Not my kind of thing, but I'm not going to judge if that's your kind of thing. Um, and yeah, yeah, I agree with what Otis is saying. The temples became this weird vehicle for redistributing wealth and reinvesting it in arts and local communities, making everyone richer. It's no wonder why when Marco Polo came here in 1273, he called the Solar Lands the richest province on Earth. Wow, probably the only true thing <laughs> that Marco Polo ever said. <laughs> Notorious liar Marco Polo, speaking the truth for once in his life. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, Otis points out uh, Pennsylvania Station in NYC, New York City. This is a sort of classic example. Uh, this old, you know, functional building, a public transit, um, they sort of remodeled, and I think it was better the way it was before. I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, talking of demolition, the British destroyed those old Tamil temples and palaces to get uh, material for railroads. Yeah, I mean, unfortunate, but yeah, this is what happens with with a lot of processes, modernization, colonialism, a lot of ancient structures and art is either destroyed or stolen, so that's a real shame. <laughs> Imagine some ancient emperor reawakens and his palace has been downsized, split up, and now contains an internet cafe and a strip club. I mean, here's what I'm going to say. Uh... Well, maybe not an old palace, but these old grand buildings, you know, just don't demolish them. I'm fine if you repurpose them for modern use. I understand that we need buildings, especially in sort of urban areas or high-density areas, to be of use. You know, high property value, all that sort of business. Just don't demolish them, you know? Just, just you know, keep, keep them to a certain extent in the way they were. But yeah, you can use them for daily activities, for the community, etc., etc., Um, the Roman walls in York go around the entire city center. And Brian asks, how can I suggest videos to you or videos for when you do lives? Um, I would say the best way is probably the Discord, um, which should be linked. Let me check. Is it not? What? Okay. It's not linked. Give me a second then. Uh, I shall... If I can get the damn the damn Discord link up. I'd say the best way, if you actually want to send a recommendation or get in contact or something, the best way to do that is probably the Discord. Um, or you can just leave it in chat. Because we, I mean, depending on at what time we finish this, we may have the opportunity to do another reaction. Maybe, maybe. I'm not promising anything. Um, but the Discord, which I just put in chat, is probably the best place, or just in the comments or wherever. Demolish them and build fish and chip shops. <laughs> oh, God. It's like, yeah, instead of demolishing grand old buildings and building fish and chip shops, you know, you could just, you know use them for that purpose anyway, if you really need to use them. So yeah, uh, basically the tangent is the destroying, you know, aesthetic old buildings or prominent old buildings is always sort of sad. 
and I think you should do the best of your ability to maintain them, especially if they hold some sort of historical importance. Solar power declined in the 12th and 13th century. Buddhism and Islam replaced Hinduism in Southeast Asia, and Tamil lands in Kerala drifted away and developed their own language and culture, which resulted in the modern Malayalam language. Okay, so we're going to need to do another time jump. You have Muslim invasion. Another time jump? Okay, my goodness. We're it seems like we're we're gonna get up to modern day at some point. We're going through a lot of a lot of time. Thirteen hundred and thirteen or sorry, thirteen thirty and thirteen thirty five, the Delhi Sultanate conquers most of India. My goodness. Look at that Delhi Sultanate. Uh oh. Uh oh. Shad knows where this is going. Uh. And Roy. <laughs> oh my goodness. Chat is having a meltdown. <laughs> okay, I know what Zod's. I don't. I mean, I don't know if we're referring to the British conquest. We've got a bit to go before then, everybody. So slow it down a little bit. I don't know how much time we're jumping over. I don't know if we're going to jump straight to that. <laughs> Uh-oh. I think we might be jumping to that. Oh, no. Destruction of the Vigiana by Muslim armies. Tamil lands fracture into small states. And, ah, here it is. No. No. No, it can't be. Not you. Not you again. Honey hair. Tis a smashing Oh, no. Not the British. Oh, God. I mean, this guy can relate. He's he's Irish. His people have been abused for hundreds of years by the English. Oh, no. This is unfortunate. <laughs> everyone's, everyone's panicking. Everyone's freaking out. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I'm not staying neutral on this. This is just an L. Just colonialism is, a, is bad. <laughs> it's an L. It's not good. And all the shit that Britain did to India, a lot of bad stuff in there, as our Indian chatters can attest to. <laughs> yeah, and, and Light sort of satirically points something out. The British conquest of India was the best thing to happen to Britain. <laughs> you know, let's take sort of a wider perspective <laughs> and we can see sort of the harm caused here. <laughs> Oh no, not the Brits. It would be a shame if someone were to plunder it. Oh no. Tamilicum was split into small competing states. The fucking Brits have arrived. Oh god. Oh no. Don't pause it when they talk about the Indian mills and what the British did. Okay in the 17th century, which made it easier for the newly arriving European powers to invade. By the end of the 18th century, most of South India was under British rule. The Tamils resisted the British invasion. One example is that of the Queen of Shivaganga, Velu Nachiar. To protect her kingdom from invasion, she built an army to resist the British imperialists. This army included a regiment of women soldiers. One of them, Kulili, volunteered to destroy a vital British ammunition depot that was located nice. inside a temple. Kalili and her fellow warriors easily uh -oh. entered the temple as worshippers because the British taught women were harmless. I can see the where this is going to go. Weapons in, they poured oil over Kalili, who then set herself on fire and leapt into the ammunition depot, blowing it up and securing victory for her queen in the following battles. Holy. Becoming the first woman martyr in India's long battle for freedom. Jeez. Despite acts like this, by 1858, the British crown had seized control of all of India. Famine quickly swept South India between 1876 and 1878, killing 8 million people. With the area Ugh. devastated by famine, the British could dismantle the over 2,000 year old Tamil textile industry. As British textile manufacturers couldn't compete with Tamil textile, so they destroyed all the Indian loom. Then they pushed Tamils out of work as craftspeople and onto tea, sugar, coffee, and opium plantations in India, or sent them off across their empire as indentured. Classic so, colonialist John activity, Sullivan, a colonial establishing plantations. In India, said, under their own dynasties, all the revenue that was collected in the country was spent in the country. Our system acts very much like a sponge, drawing up all the good things from the banks of the Ganges and squeezing them out on the banks of the Thames. Yeah. First off, he it's Thames. Mispronounced that. But there you go. 
Uh, there's a great summary of the British colonial mission from a colonial chap himself. Um, during their own dynasties, uh, the native dynasties of the country, the revenue that was collected in the country was spent in the country. The British colonial system acted like a sponge, absorbing all of the revenue, all of the good stuff, and squeezing it out elsewhere, back into Britain. As we said, of course, these colonial missions were very beneficial for Britain itself, um, but that's because it's extractive. <laughs> these imperialist missions are extractive. They extract the wealth from the region and bring it back to the metropole. And there you go. You have a great description from someone who was involved himself, so you don't have to take my word for it. India would eventually win its independence from Britain in 1947. Ooh, whoa, in the first ooh. two decades of Indian independence, language became a battlefield in India. In 1950, Hindi, the most spoken language in India... Better used in Britain anyway. Uh, I think the much larger population of India would frankly disagree with that. I think they would like to have their native resources kept within their country. <laughs> was selected as the sole official language of oh the really uh -oh. Language in india was selected as the sole official language of the country this is fascinating so i mean we've we've passed the british colonial period we moved into independence and now we get to some of these issues of the modern nation state the issues of ethnicity and language making, uh, you know, a specific language, your official language, which can cause a lot of issues with minority ethnic groups. Um, you know, in the United States, I, I'm pretty sure we don't have an official language. Um, of course, English is by far our most widely spoken language, but because, you know, we have, like, prominent Spanish-speaking communities and stuff like that, um, but other countries do have official languages languages and that can that can cause some issues <laughs> at times nineteen fifty four the year the year Ethan was it yet born important moment in history hmm the whole act was highly controversial says Shad yeah look that's what happens when you have situations like this where you basically you might have a majority ethnic group or something, and then you try to take their culture or language and raise it above the rest, make it supreme, make it official, etc., etc. And like I said, that can cause a lot of issues with other ethnic groups. And we see this sort of thing in a lot of countries around the world, especially a lot of countries that suffered under imperialism and then gained their independence. That can leave a lot of uh, ethnic issues. Uh, a lot of odd mixes, a lot of problems. <laughs> Light says, in America, we speak American. Line heard often. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, we don't have an official language in the United States uh, on a federal level. No official language, even though, of course, English is the most wide spoken. I think that's a good recognition of the reality that it's a sort of diverse country uh, with a lot of different communities speaking different languages. With 1965 picked as the year the changeover from English would happen. Speakers of the Dravidian languages in the south didn't like Hindi because it was Sanskrit based, which they considered more alien than English. As 1965 wow. approached, thousands of Tamil student protesters shouted, Hindi never, English ever. Uh, okay, so that's what that was a reference to. Okay, I respect that. I mean, you know, you're trying to protect uh, your regional, your native culture against some sort of basically government encroachment. There's no national language in Tamil. It's pretty common in the South, but there are still people pushing to make Hindi official. Yeah. I mean, we, we talk about this occasionally, especially with Shad and Chat. There's a lot of, you know, Hindi nationalism in India. There can be a lot of conflict there, you know, some ethnic conflict, that sort of business. The streets of Seni. Four students set themselves on fire as a symbol of non-violent protest. Mm. Dravidian political parties made it clear that if Hindi became the official language of India, then Tamil Nadu would secede from India. The protesters won. The Official Languages Act Amendment of 1967 ensured the continued use of English alongside Hindi as the official language of India up until today. Wow. Even now in India, 
Tamil Nadu is famous for its independent streak, love of its culture and language, and for acting as the champion of Dravidian politics against the North. Hmm. Yeah, look at that split. But Tamils don't only live in Tamil Nadu. Just a few kilometers away from there is the ah. island nation known today as Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka! You know, a nation that we've very briefly talked about before, but basically just for me to say that I don't know anything about it. So if we're going to get a little bit about... Yeah, we are. Okay, we're going to get a little bit about Sri Lanka. That's fun. Uh, this will definitely be stuff that I'm unfamiliar with, so that's exciting. Why is the solution to everything secession, look at America, didn't work out well? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's sort of a... It's an issue brought on by, I guess, the sort of modern nation-state structure. Since that is the global accepted and pushed structure of organization, secession becomes a much more common option because people want to have, you know, their own their own countries, they want to have self-government, they want to maintain their cultures, and so a lot of people go to secession, uh, although that is sort of the nuclear option, you know, that's not the first thing that people usually go to. But yeah, I mean, it didn't work out well for an Amer in the American context. <laughs> we had our own civil war. The Sri Lankan civil war, they've been constantly at war with themselves ever since independence. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, and Shad points this out. I mean, you, you saw this in the news recently. Sri Lanka uh, of late has been in a bit of an economic and political crisis uh, lately, unfortunately. Uh, in general, the subcontinent was and is a crossroads for humans. Uh, ex we are distinct, non-homo sapien relatives. Uh, ex oh, I see what you're saying. The subcontinent was and is a crossroads for humans and our extinct non-homo sapien relatives. And there will always be a indifference or difference in people since it is a crossroads and try I think I know what you're saying yeah I mean I agree with Shad like obviously like imperialism is a really complicated process and so is the British Raj but the overall effects are so negative so extractive so damaging to the people of the region that it seems almost a little disingenuous to, or, I don't know, a little odd to point out the positives. You know what I mean? It's like if you're talking about someone like the Nazis or Hitler, and you say, hey, what about the good stuff? Or like slavery in the United States. Hey, what about the economic benefits? It's like, well, what about them? <laughs> you know, it's like absolutely horrific. Where Tamils make up 15% of the population. 15% to several ethnic groups. The mostly Buddhist Sinhalese are the majority, and the mostly Hindu Tamils are the second largest group. Both groups have been on the island for over 2,000 years. God this damn! This was known as Ceylon when it suffered three centuries of colonialism under Portugal, the Netherlands, and then their British Empire took over. <laughs> Hitler was against smoking, and I think he was a he was a vegetarian, right? Uh, I believe. For in 1796, when the British arrived, they were like, "How can I make?" everything worse oh. <laughs> typical british attitude typical british attitude hey how can i just make this worse now look if you look around the world like if you look around the world say at like the last 100 years you know we're talking about the, the end of british empire and decolonization and you look at some of the a lot of the issues that have happened or a lot of the sort of modern issues that a lot of countries are facing Let's be honest, a lot of them can be pointed back to British colonization and then the process of decolonization caused a lot of issues that a lot of countries are still facing today. Let's introduce inter-ethnic conflict. Uh-oh. It seems like it's going to get even worse. We've already seen a bit of inter-ethnic conflict in this video. I get the feeling it's going to be worse. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, Shad says, we learned about this civil war in a bit of detail, I imagine he means in school, mainly due to the discrimination against the Tamils. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, to spur hatred, the British chose Tamils for higher positions than the Sinhalese in the government. 
Then, in the Sri Lankan highlands, Sinhalese lands were seized by the British and enslaved Tamils from India who were settled there as plantation workers. God, the... Just, uh, just the same thing everywhere. It's like, all right, enslaved plantations, you know, just so typical. German colonialism was far worse. Think about the horrific German influence on Papua New Guinea. Yeah, well, if we're talking about, you know, like non-European German <laughs> colonialism, then it was far lesser in extent than British or French colonialism. The Germans just had a hard time developing their colonial empire. But, of course, if we're talking about... Uh, you know, how you want to say, the 1930s and 40s, where the Germans did a bit of conquering closer to home. Yeah, that was truly horrific. Uh, but outside of that, the German colonial mission was just less extensive than other European countries. The Sinhalese language is an Indo-Aryan language, though it's so south. Huh, interesting. Hey, I see your videos about history. I like your reasoning. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Ultimate Truth. I appreciate that. Welcome to chat. These are Indian Tamils, distinct from the Sri Lankan Tamils who have lived in Sri Lanka for much, much longer. Oh, Sri Lankan Tamils live interesting. In the north and east. Indian Tamils live in the Central Highlands, and the Sinhalese live essentially everywhere else. Hmm. When the British got kicked out of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, in 1948, the majority of Sinhalese took control of the island. Sinhalese nationalism exploded. And soon, anti-Tamil massacres swept the island. In 1956... <laughs> Interesting question from Light. Do you think Austria-Hungary was equipped to handle these ethnic conflicts? They did have experience. True, they did have experience. Um, but I will point to you, point you towards the history of Austria-Hungary as evidence that in the end, they didn't really handle their own inter-ethnic conflicts. So, no, <laughs> they probably weren't qualified to handle anyone else's inter-ethnic conflicts. 1958 and 1977, which led to the formation of a guerrilla fighting group known as the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, better mm. known as the Tamil Tigers. On the 31st of May, 1981, the Sri Lankan police burned the Jaffna Public Library to the ground. Oh, home man. to 97,000 books and containing irreplaceable artifacts of Tamil history. Damn. The... Burning libraries. Burning books. Just not good. <laughs> not good at all. Fire. One Tamil refugee said, It was as if my entire biography, my history and the history of the Tamils had been destroyed. Wiped from the face of the earth as if we did not exist. Mm, yeah, it's tragic. On July 3rd, 1983, the Tamil Tigers ambushed and killed 15 Sri Lankan soldiers, causing another anti-Tamil massacre to sweep uh, the country in an event known as Black July. The oh, Sri Lankan God. Civil War. 1983, wow, this is so modern. I'm going to be honest, I didn't know anything about this. Yeah, not good. Bad stuff. And whenever you have a, you know, black and then, like, a, like you know, it's just a bad sign, you know? Just a bad sign. Sign of some sort of massacre or whatever. I'm back. What did I miss? Uh, well, I'm not sure when you left Magma, but we've been learning about the Tamil people. Um, some really great stuff about Tamil history, their golden age, their wealth. Uh, we sort of moved into a more modern era now. Uh, we've seen some of the ethnic conflict within India, and now we're seeing some pretty terrible violence in Sri Lanka, unfortunately. Four had begun. <laughs> Yo, is, that, is this allowed on YouTube? What is happening? I don't want to get... <laughs> I mean, I know the video is up on their channel, but... <laughs> you know, YouTube TOS, I'm getting a little bit nervous. The Tamil Tigers were fighting for an independent Tamil nation in the Tamil parts of the island. As the war dragged on over decades, the Tamils became infamous for inventing the explosive suicide vest and for carrying out a suicide bombing campaign. Inventing the explosive suicide vest? Did I hear that right? They invented it? Wow. Well, that is, uh, that's quite the invention to have under your belt. I guess I'll put it that way. Uh, one that's been used in a variety of different contexts since that point. I can't, but re invented it? I find that sort of hard to believe. I mean, it seems like a fairly sort of simple concept <laughs> across Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan army retaliated with brutal attacks against the Tamil Tigers, which mostly resulted in the deaths and displacement of tens of thousands of innocent Tamil civilians. I mean, of course it does. Of course it does. Whenever we have this sort of ethnic conflict or civil war, 
and you have, you know, uh, some sort of rebel force fighting against the government, you know, everybody knows, what does it always result in? Uh, it results in civilian death and displacement. I mean, just, just check the boxes. It's just so typical. Real, real unfortunate, real unfortunate. Indian intelligence also provided arms training and monetary support to six Sri Lankan Tamil insurgent groups. Oh, interesting. Not just the CIA, yeah. Uh, okay, so why was that? What, what? Because we've already talked about the sort of ethnic tension within India. What uh, motivation did Indian intelligence agencies have to intervene in this conflict? Because I don't know necessarily the history or the relationship between India and Sri Lanka at this point. Um, and yes, not, not just the CIA who, you know, have their dirty little fingers in <laughs> any sort of ethnic conflict or civil war uh, in recent memory. The Tamil massacres and all that. Okay, interesting. So it was like the extremity of the conflict that convinced them to, to get involved. Interesting. The Sri Lankan state is still undergoing investigations for committing a genocide against the Tamil. Ugh. This bloody war dragged on for 26 years until the 18th. Uh, wait, a funny comment from Roy Dean. The closer you get to modern era, the more political history seems to get. I'm going to tell you something, Roy Dean. History has actually always been the same amount of political. <laughs> it's just the closer we get to the modern era, the more we remember it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, that's what it is. It's just you have people who remember this history or people whose parents or grandparents remember this history. And, of course, it's still in such recent memory that you have a lot of polarization and a lot of, you know, different opinions and all that sort of stuff. Uh, still sort of hard-hitting to many people. But history is... I, I always find it funny when people talk about, like, the politicization of history. <laughs> yeah, and, and Roy D says, was Caesar marching on Rome political? <laughs> you know, history has always been really political. Always. It just only, you know feels political when we talk about stuff that becomes relevant to us, you know? <laughs> the conflict, yeah. No politics in the Roman Republic, as Light says. Another lie from Ethan. No politics at all there. <laughs> uh, okay, and back on the in intervention of in Indian intelligence, Shad says, that's the reason I think they tried to use, but you don't know what the real reason was. That's fair. I mean, oftentimes there's an underlying reason that might be we don't necessarily know or, you know, whatever. Um, and I'm, I'm not that familiar with the situation. I mean, if you show me a CIA intervention, you know, and there's a stated reason, I can probably tell you that the real reason is the defense of American interests in some way or another. But I'm not familiar with this particular instance, of course. 15th of May, 2009, when the leader of the Tamil Tigers, V. Pirapakaran, was killed and the Tigers surrendered. The war took the lives wow. of over 100... So this is some real, real recent history. ...a thousand people, with 40,000 Tamil civilians being killed in the final few months of the war. These are rough estimates because a proper investigation hasn't been done. The war caused a mass exodus of Sri Lankan Tamil refugees to India, Australia, Europe and North America. Wow. So around 8 million Tamils live outside of India and Sri Lanka. From the 19th century onwards, they went as indentured laborers across the British Empire, especially to Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, Fiji, Mauritius, and the Caribbean. Where wow, look at that. I mean, a whole lot in Malaysia in particular. Almost 2 million Tamils in Malaysia. That's a lot. Though Malaysia has a pretty big population. 600,000 in South Africa. I, I wonder if that's because of the connection to the British Empire. A lot in Singapore. Where many have kept their Tamil identity. Tamil. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimate Truth says, careful, my guy. Some videos will get you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to avoid any sort of trouble from YouTube. But, I mean, these are up on YouTube. So we should be fine. We should be fine. Uh, and, yeah, Roy Dean points out uh, a video talking about genocide, chat, Roman history, Punic War, and Caesar. Yeah, chat is uh, chat's on a different topic at the moment. It's all the British Empire they removed as servants. Yep, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, it's actually an official language in Singapore and Malaysia. Well, I think now it's time to take a look at Tamil culture. Great. Today, about eighty-eight percent. Okay, great. We've got uh, like seven minutes left, and we talk about 
Tamil culture, religion overall. Okay, I'm interested. Of the Tamil population of Tamil Nadu are Hindu. 6% are Christians, 5.8% are Muslims, and Jains, Buddhists, and Sikhs make up the rest. Mm. The most important Tamil festival is Thai Punko, a harvest festival dedicated to the Hindu sun god, Surya, that usually occurs on the 14th of January. This festival is celebrated by all Tamils regardless of religion though. Punkal means to boil or overflow, and refers to the traditional dish of new harvest rice boiled in milk. <laughs> Late to the party, what exactly are we doing? Well, uh, we started off, I remember you here at the beginning, we started off with our video on the Abbasid Caliphate, and now we're talking about who are the Tamil people. Uh, we're pretty far into the video, so we're just learning about Tamil history, culture, religion, all that sort of business. Milk with raw sugar. Punkal celebrations include decorating cows, ritual bathing, parades, prayers, dances, creating art, and getting together with friends and family and exchanging gifts. During Punkal in Tamil Nadu, you might also see a jolly kutta. In this over 2,000 year old sport, an Indian bull is released into a crowd. And Roy Dean says, if my bad memory serves me right, I think there's an interesting story about Indian workers building railways in Africa for Brits who got eaten by man-eating lions because the locals refused to build for the British. Yeah, to my understanding, the British used Indian labor for a lot of different things throughout their colonial empire. Um, will there be other videos after this? Uh, you know what? It depends how long it takes us to finish this, but if we finish relatively soon, then I think we could be in store for another short reaction. So... If you have any videos you want to suggest, short videos in particular, you know, this is what we do at the end of the stream. I ask for another short reaction, but I think we may have more time. Um, I mean, we've got about six minutes left. That could take us anywhere from like half an hour to like an hour and a half. If it takes us an hour and a half, then no, we're not doing any more. But if we finish relatively quickly, then I think we will have time for another video. What do you think is a short video? I would say ideally less than 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, 10 minutes is short. C close to 10 minutes, I think, would be nice. Um, but let's finish this one first. Out of people, and men attempt to grab the hump on the bull's back with both arms and hang onto it for as long as possible, attempting to bring the bull to a... As intre- because this is basically just bullfighting. It's interesting how, like, the sport of bullfighting has seemingly developed independently in several different places i guess humans just see like big scary animals or let's be honest i think men see big scary animals and go i can i can wrestle that i i can i can wrestle that how about you oh, yeah yeah i can do it what do you mean and then it becomes a sport over time or maybe it comes from like stealing livestock from your neighbor or something like that um but it seems like it has developed in many places sort of independently Full stop. Thus taming the bull. If they do so, they get a prize. If no one tames the bull, the owner of the bull gets a prize. There have been many attempts to ban this sport in recent years, which has caused massive popular backlash. I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, I agree with Light. I think bullfighting is pretty stupid. But, you know, you, you sort of... This is where... I mean, you see this elsewhere. You run into a bit of a problem where you have maybe humanitarian concerns or something like that over a particular practice, and then the culture is sort of pushing back. <laughs> I think we need to go back to good old gladiator fights so we don't hurt innocent animals so much. Okay, buddy. Ignoring the human harm. Gladiators fought a lot of animals as well. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess you're advocating to bring back specifically human-on-human gladiator matches which i think i would still have an issue with <laughs> another interesting tamil holiday is a may festival for the god aravan who is worshipped by transgender people called Tevrunar in tamil at the oh. annual festival at Kofi that's Kofi, interesting you'll see ceremonial marriages between festival goers and the god aravan along with beauty pageants and dances hosted with the support of the tamil nadu government in 2008, hmm. Tamil Nadu became the first state in India to allow people to legally identify as a third gender. Wow, Arts. that's fascinating. I know that, uh, and I've heard this before in cultures around the world, um, there are, of course, different ideas about gender and being transgender 
or third genders and that sort of business, um, you know, because we have a particular view of it in the West. But to my understanding, and I don't know much about this, there are, you know, a lot of different views on gender depending on where you go throughout the world. So I think that's a pretty interesting concept. Uh, transgender people are actually supported in Indian culture, trans women at least. Yeah, that's fascinating. Their blessing is considered good luck, especially in marriages. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that sort of thing is really interesting. Um, you know, different cultural practices across the world and how they interact with something that many people feel is so fundamental, like gender. You know, interesting stuff. Tanjibur paintings and solar bronzes are some of the Tamil's greatest contributions to world art. But one of the more humble yet distinct features of Tamil art is the kolam, which decorates the front of almost every Tamil home. These are geometrical and floral designs made of rice flour. Each day the kolam is crafted by women and then erased the next morning to make room for a new one. Today mm. in Tamil Nadu, huts to five-star hotels will all have a kolam. <laughs> one of the most treasured pieces of Tamil literature is the Tirukuru by Tiru Vulavar, which had its origins in the Sangam period but was finalized a few centuries after. This is a masterpiece in ethics and living well. The Tirukuru is made up of three books of wise sayings on virtue, wealth and love, all delivered in quick two-line poems. For <laughs> example, the greatest virtue of all is non-killing, truthfulness cometh only next. It also just stops midway and talks about how to build good forts and I'm always down for some good talk. Brilliant. You know, when I'm reading a book, maybe for some sort of self-help to learn about myself and what I should do, I always want some advice on fortification halfway through. You know, I think that could be very useful to my personal experience. I mean, we talked about this last stream, <laughs> which was all about raising a medieval army and siege warfare. What if I need to conduct some siege warfare or build a fort? I mean, the trend continues. Clearly, people know how important this is to everyday life. Charity and kindness are also key aspects, and it emphasizes non-violence and vegetarianism. Mm. Avoidance of killing and eating the meat of even one animal is more meritorious than a thousand sacrifices. Shad puts forth maybe the fortification is more metaphorical in meaning. Maybe Shad, or maybe he's talking about literally building a fort. I mean, you never know when that could be useful. <sighs> Ethan, please do a live stream of you reading every Bible chapter for Audible. <laughs> yeah, that would be a pretty big uh, directional change. My channel just turns into reading religious, like, audiobooks of religious books, religious texts. When I'm reading a recipe on how to make Roman bread, I want a section informing me on how to build a Roman legionnaire camp. Hey, I mean, you never know, you never know. The Tirukuru is vital to Tamil culture. It pops up in songs, films, and books. Every bus in Tamil Nadu is legally obligated to have a verse from the Tirukuru huh. on it. One of the Tamil's most famous dances. I like that. I like that. I mean, if you've got a book that's so important to your culture, you know, you put little tidbits on public transit. That, that's, a, that's a nice little thing, I think. It's Paratanateum. This dance tells a story through complicated uh, movements what? of the most famous dances. It's one of our most famous dances, a thousand years old, a thousand plus years old, banned until 1910 under British rule. Dude, the Brits, the Brits love this. You know, whenever they conquer a country, they just love banning traditional practice. I mean, I can talk about it from a Scottish perspective, of course, banning the traditional dress and traditional practices and stuff like that. But this is true uh, across the British Empire. They're just like, yeah, so, you know, we're going to ban your traditional practices. Uh, it's like, okay, what? Why? Why? Come on now. I mean, it's control and all that sort of business, but it just sucks. Uh, and, and Shad has an issue with the pronunciation. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> you can tell us how it's actually pronounced Shad. Uh, once again, you know, I do give some credit to my, my you know, Irish narrator here for g giving a solid attempt for trying at the very least on all of these different words. I'm surprised the British didn't ban Shad. Well, Shad, you're lucky it's me running this chat. <laughs> you know, I've, I've escaped the uh, the British Isles, come to America. If I was still in Britain, who knows what I would do. Uh, <laughs> Barut not yum. Hmm. 
This dance tells a story to Yeah, that, that sounds pretty different than the way that Shad <laughs> Shad spelt it out. Complicated mudras or hand gestures, facial expressions and body posture. It also just looks incredible. Food. Nice. Right. I, I will say Zod's fairly points out the <laughs> the one okay, the one thing I will criticize this narrator on is he didn't say Thames correctly. Come on, man. I know you're in Ireland, but, you know, Britain ain't that far. You, you should know how to pronounce the River Thames. <laughs> this is a food! Mmm, okay, this is good. There's gonna be some good food, I think. Food. Rice is the staple of the mostly vegetarian Tamil diet. Bananas and plantains, jackfruit, coconut, lentils, tamarind, and mango are also commonly used ingredients, along with a huge amount of spices mm. traditionally a tamil meal is eaten off of a banana leaf some favorite tamil foods include the light and fluffy idli the fried and spicy Ooh. badai the crispy dosa, and the delicious fried banana bonda and no Ooh. tamil dishes <laughs> without a side of sambar chutney <laughs> there's no history here it's just me ooing and eyeing at the tasty looking food <laughs> or in sri lanka coconut sambal Tamils also love their coffee which they brew in this unique south indian device Ooh. cinema Tamil people are okay. Well, we moved on from f honestly the food section was just an, <laughs> they just showed some pictures of you know nice looking food, but looks great. I mean, yeah, I food, yeah, I love. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm a bit of a foodie. I love food, Indian food, fantastic. Uh, they, they do they just just a great job. I mean, my goodness. Uh, food history is history. This is true. Roy Dean points this out. We haven't done really any food history on the channel, but. I know there are some YouTubers who do food history. It's kind of different from what we've typically done, but food history absolutely is history, and uh, I think it's really interesting. As someone who both enjoys history and enjoys good food, I think food history is fascinating. Um, and un underrated. Underrated as well. Um, you know, I think... And I'm a part of the problem because I don't know much about food history, but I think these other fields of history, you, we have like a, you know, our food history, fashion history, economic history. There's so much history. It's so underrated. Uh, honestly, Roy Dean, uh, I don't, I probably prefer Ethan. I don't mind. People can call me whatever. I know that my channel is called History Student Reacts, so people automatically go for that. And if you use History Student Reacts, I'm pretty sure you can, like, directly at me in chat. But, uh, I'd probably prefer Ethan, because, you know, it's easier, and it's my name. <laughs> but I don't mind either. <laughs> yeah, Sh Shad needs to learn how to how to do some, some classic Indian cooking. You can just boil an egg. Brian can cook Mexican, Italian, Indian. Oh my goodness, this guy, he can cook everything. Passionate about cinema. Based in the Kodobakum neighborhood in Senna, the Tamil film industry, or Kollywood, is the second largest film industry in India. Film. Andy Ratnam's gangster epic Nayakam was included in Time Magazine's 100 Best Movies of All Time list. Wow. I actually watched a movie with one of Tamil cinema's superstars, Rajini Khan, where this happens and it was an absolutely amazing few hours yeah well clips like this always go uh viral over the internet of these like crazy indian movies they look like a blast I i've never watched any but they look insane <laughs> light misses our yeah light misses uh roman our resident chinese history expert <laughs> yeah i'll be sure to tell roman that <laughs> that's funny Yeah, and Roy Dean keeps making the point about Indian food being in the UK. <laughs> Tamil cinema has even bled into Tamil politics. Three oh. chief minister. There's the there, there's the chief minister, and he's he's acting or something. Of the Tamil Nadu state have risen out of Tamil cinema. Tamil cinema acts as a way for Tamils to preserve their independent and original culture by producing films in the Tamil language based on. I love that like Irish and I know some Brits pronounce it the same way film for film film 
on Tamil ideas and culture. I wish there were something like that for YouTubers, so they could create independent and high quality educational content for people that just love learning. Oh wait, Kogito oh, are we done? Career friends we're done! And made our own oh my goodness, that came out of nowhere. Okay. Uh, Alright, we're done. The rest of it's just an ad. Um, great. I gotta say, great video suggestion from Shad. Um, I know that we joke about him losing all the polls, but, you know, I wanted to do this, so that's why I specifically planned this live stream. Um, so, yeah. I thought that was a great video. We, we learned a lot. Um, really, really interesting. Learning about something I've never, never heard much about. Um, okay. So, what's going to happen is I'm going to take a short break to use the bathroom and fill up my water, which I've drank most of. And what you guys are going to do is you're going to leave in chat recommendations for whatever you want next. Remember, I would rather do a shorter video. So, 10 minutes, great. 15 minutes or less, okay? That's what we want. So, uh, you know, leave them in chat, and I'm going to take a break. Uh, I'll be back in a short couple of minutes. And then we will do a uh, another reaction because we have the time today, fortunately. All right, hello everybody. Welcome back. Let me see what everybody has put forward. <laughs> uh, sorry, was that a little loud? <laughs> uh, how Polynesians found the Americas. 
Polynesians, found America. <laughs> Little, little, Mike was a little distorted. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't do that every time. Why wasn't Thailand colonized? Ooh, that sounds interesting. Because I don't know the answer to that. I know of a th short three-hour video on the Roman conquest of Greece. Yeah, those seem to be oxymoronic. Short three hour like that I think I'm literally three hours that would take us like nine hours to get through founding of Mexico ooh interesting that's an interesting one uh Tamerlane Tamerlane uh okay is that everything? Uh, true story of Alfred the Great. All right, got it. <laughs> a quick 20 hour retrospective on Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. All right. Don't forget my recommendation. No. Okay, send it again in chat. What was your recommendation? Send it again, and I'll take a look. Ethan reacts to Ethan playing Skyrim. Yeah, I react to my own videos. Did the Polynesians discover America? Okay, interesting, interesting. Why... Wasn't Thailand colonized by Nologia? Looks like an interesting one. Yeah, Roy Dean has apparently not been bribed to support Light's suggestion. Tamerlane. Uh, what was it? Was it the Epimetheus Tamerlane video? Yes, it was. And the true story of Alfred the Great. True story of Alfred the Great. Oh, and the, uh, the founding of Mexico. Forgot to pull that one up. Founding of Mexico... Extra history. Uh, the founding of Mexico, Aztec myths. Okay, interesting. Um, okay. We're not doing Alfred the Great, because I don't want to. <laughs> and also, uh, Zod's already sent a, uh, a Tamerlane suggestion, so that's going to be his. And let's let's not do the one on the Polynesians, because that's a little bit of an older video. So let's do. Uh, okay, we're gonna do a poll. Everyone's favorite. I have not been looking at the, the politics in chat. So I'm, I'm coming into this. No biases. Why wasn't Thailand colonized? The founding of Mexico or Tamerlane and the Timurid Empire. All right. Those are your three options, everybody. Get voting. <laughs> the 
Very graphic and brutal. My goodness, we've got a lot in store for us. <laughs> what? Well, light suggestion, that was the Thailand one? <laughs> Looks like his politicking is working. My goodness. I hope you guys, I mean, look, this is a... We're, we're introducing some democracy here. I hope you're voting genuinely based on uh, what you wish to see and not based on coercion. That's all I'm going to say. It's like T Tamerlane is uh, behind, frankly, right now. This is not a major. It's not a majoritarian system, so I don't need a majority for one to win. I'll just go with the one that has the highest percentage. Chad, you didn't even vote for your own option. There's only twelve votes. <laughs> one vote's pretty significant. <laughs> you, you. I mean, you got you got pretty close. You probably you might have been able to win this one. And then you didn't even vote for your own option. <laughs> what is this self-defeating attitude? <laughs> uh oh, Zods is going. Zods is going Trump on us. He demands a revote. Yeah, if if Zods or sorry, if Light had suggested the founding of Mexico, it would have won probably somehow. All right, I'm going to give this, like, one more minute, and then I'm going to end it. I'm going to give it one more minute. And then we're going to go with the highest voted option. Uh, I doubt we're going to get enough people in here to, to shift it. It looks like we're doing Why Wasn't Thailand Colonized? Um, I, frankly, I thought... I mean, I removed two of the options <laughs> before we voted, but uh, I thought they all sounded pretty interesting. Uh, founding of Mexico, well, that's pretty interesting. Tamerlane, well, that's pretty interesting. Why wasn't Thailand colonized? Well, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> so I could go for any of them. All right, it's been a minute. I'm ending it. It's done. We have to end the poll at some point. Why wasn't Thailand colonized? One. In the end... A fairly handy victory. Wasn't that close. Um, the, the vote was split between the other two. You know, I think maybe if Shad had voted for his own option <laughs> and consolidated more support, then the founding of Mexico could have won. But that's not what happened. That's not what happened. I, I know Zods, but you got to cut it off at some point. Uh, I, I had to give a, a strict cutoff. Plus, you would need several more people to come in and vote for for your option to win. So we'll be doing, why wasn't Thailand colonized? I think that's a good question. And uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, it's also an interesting topic. It's one that I can't specifically speak on. But, you know, obviously I have some general knowledge on sort of the European colonization of this era, so uh, I think it's an interesting thing to ask. As the powers. Oops. Uh, yes. We see Zod's commiserating. <laughs> well, you know, just think about your campaigning strategies for next time. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, yeah. As, same as Shad is pointing out, I know why Ethiopia wasn't colonized. Uh, but that's a real famous example. I think a lot of people know about Ethiopia. Uh, I don't know as much about Thailand. So, uh, interesting question. No revotes, chat, except your defeat like Bibulus. Damn, that's a little harsh. I would say you don't have to accept your defeat as badly as Bibulus. That would be truly sad and pathetic. <laughs> Alright, so... And this is our last reaction of the day. We're not we're not doing any more after this. Why wasn't Thailand colonized? Let's get into it. As the powers of Europe began to grow and expand throughout the world's history, colonialism became the forefront of this expansion. 
Over time, almost every non-European nation became a colony of one European nation or another at some point. Only yeah. a few countries managed to escape becoming overpowered by the Europeans, which makes us wonder, how did they do it? For a nation how? like Thailand, which was surrounded by British, French, and Dutch territories, the sea Yeah, that's true. I mean... This is true for basically <laughs> most countries at this point, but they were not in a particularly advantageous position geographically. Same for Ethiopia. They were surrounded by other colonial powers. So as Thailand, you know, they're sort of in a pretty risky position. Uh, I mean, as you can see, mainly at risk from Britain and France. Seemed to be no hope of avoiding colonialism. And yet, somehow, not the British nor the French, or even the Dutch, ever colonized Thailand, and neither did- Not even the Dutch? My goodness. <laughs> uh, and Roy Dean, your question's been answered. Zods, I have a plan. No one type in chat during the video, so we finish it in 15 minutes, and then we can watch Tamerlane after. That's not gonna happen. We are not getting another reaction after this one. Not even Luxembourg? <laughs> any other European power. So if Thailand was never subject to colonialism, how did it manage to hmm. pull that off? Yeah, how did how did it do that? How did it do that? There are a few reasons to explain why no one ever decided to colonize Thailand, or at the time, the Kingdom of Siam. Firstly, the Brits and French in particular were actually a bit relieved to have some buffer territory between their uh, colonies. With yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff we could talk about, and I don't know what exactly is going to be the reason. So you know, there's of course the actions of whoever was in charge of Thailand at the time. There is basically intercolonial politics. You have the Brits and the French. Maybe they want to have a buffer state in between them. There's the natural environment. Um, I don't, I'm, uh, well, I don't really know. My guess is that maybe it's pretty foresty <laughs> in there. Maybe kind of difficult to conquer. Uh, I know Vietnam can certainly be that way at times, uh, and the French had a lot of issues with Vietnam at times. Um, ah, Light, your mom is from Thailand, so you do have relations to this topic. Very interesting. A new Light fact, Light lore. I think Ethan likes the sound of his own voice. I mean, this is true, but also, you know, the whole point of a React channel is that I add my perspective and voice to the video. If I didn't do that, then there would be no point of this, nor would it be transformative. So I do like the sound of my own voice, but it's also good that <laughs> I contribute something. Uh, huh. This whole time I thought Light was secret, the, the reincarnation of Bernadotte. Well, in some ways I think Light is. I mean, Light always comes to the defense of Bernadotte. <laughs> Thank you, Zahats. <laughs> Thailand rulers took a page from the Japanese book. Interesting. All right, well, let's learn. Britain now possessing Malaysia and Burma, and the French taking Indochina. The two European powerhouses had found themselves only separated by the land of Siam. Without mm. it, both sides feared potential border disputes and therefore uh -oh. were excessively hesitant to take the kingdom for themselves. Mm. The Netherlands had also entered the region when it colonized Indonesia. And although this buffers... The Netherlands. Some... <laughs> you know, we don't usually talk about the Netherlands, to be honest, on this channel. But uh, at one point, the Netherlands were a fairly prominent colonial power. You know, they controlled... A lot of the trade of this region, the spice trade. Um, now, of course, you know, over time, the Netherlands sort of declined in their international prominence. But hey, you know, the Dutch did hold a lot of power at one point. The Dutch had no idea how resource-rich their possessions were until very late in the game. Uh, and Dennis is recusing himself. <laughs> he claims no responsibility for his country's past. Hey, that is completely fair. <laughs> State wasn't necessarily needed for them, since it was not between Indonesia and the other colonies. The general state of peace that it could help maintain in the area was still a benefit for the Dutch. 
So, this established an immediate reason for Siam to remain uncolonized from the very start. Right. But it wasn't the only factor. Oh, okay. Secondly, the Siamese kings, especially Chula Long Korn, realized that in order to avoid colonization, they had to transform their political system into a more Europeanized version. This became a massive nation building project. This is true. This is true. And uh, someone said earlier, taking a page from the Japanese book, uh, and of course Japan is probably the, the best example of this with you know the good old Meiji Restoration, basically incorporating a lot of European methods of governance and modernization, etc., etc., to turn themselves into this modern military powerhouse uh, and adopt European ways of doing things, which sort of allowed them to step up to Europe uh, in one way or another. I think this is true, you know, because Europe is the, you know, I mean, Europe as a whole, all these different European great powers are the colonial masters at this point. In order to avoid colonization, avoid imperialism, which is very, very challenging, you have to sort of, I guess, bring yourself to their level to a certain point because, you know, the Europeans really don't want to accept any other nations as at their level. You know, I mean, just look at the Russo-Japanese War. It was an absolute shocker that Japan performed as well as they did. Uh, there was a lot of doubt and racism. But you got to try your best <laughs> to sort of pull your way up um, if you want to resist European power. And it seems like that is the direction that these Thai rulers are sort of coming from. And Zod's, Zod's is shouting out King William III. He's bringing back the good old classic Catholic-Protestant rivalry. And yeah, I th and I think Light points it out, which is, under these conditions, you know, you still don't... You obviously still don't have a whole lot of control over your country's own affairs, but it is better than being directly conquered by these European countries. It's better than becoming a colony, even if, you know, you lack... A lot of control over your own affairs and how you do things you have to take a particular direction well it's better than being a damn colony right hmm yeah the only dutch conflict dennis supports is against the seas uh and chad says the only nation to go to war with the sea and actually win yeah so far i'll put it that way oh and dennis yep dennis says for now yeah the Dutch have gone to war with the ocean, and they've won for now. I hate to break it to you, but uh, I don't think it's going to hold up in the future. I think the Dutch are in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, your country's going to be underwater at some point, unless you can work out something. <laughs> that led to the modernization of today's Thailand. An important aspect of this project was map making. The Siamese Ooh. realized that the Europeans put a lot of emphasis on knowledge, especially topographical knowledge. True. The Europeans used maps to define territory that they ruled, and when borders were... This is true. Well, I mean, if we look, say we use uh, the African continent as an example, if we look at the European, European imperial missions, what were some of the earliest branches of that European colonialism. Well, first off, religion, you know, a lot of missionaries, they were sort of the vanguard of European colonization is what I call them, but also explorers, cartographers, you know, they go out to Africa, map the place, and then that gives Europe an opportunity to go conquer and draw lines on the map. So these are important aspects of imperialism. Yeah, the Dutch Navy was quite formidable back in the day. Maps are underrated. Maps can be a very important tool for building empire. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, every nation along the coast, uh, any coast, is probably in trouble. But the Netherlands in particular, since they saved themselves from the sea, and now it's going to consume them. <laughs> so I think they're in trouble. ill-defined, they used this as an opportunity to take the land. Also, 
the concentration of power was important. In the Siamese Mandala system, power wasn't well defined. Local rulers maintained a high level of autonomy in mm. different regions, and that could have been a problem for the whole kingdom. After this problem was realized, a standing professional army was introduced. This shows the unity of the kingdom. And it Interesting. So we have the centralization of power. Uh, which is sort of a key part of modernization. And that's really important. Because when we think about these European colonization efforts, something we see a lot is, you know, we see these powerful European empires, these powerful European centralized nation states. And then throughout the rest of the world, you know, there may be some kingdoms, some empires, some states, but the nation state is just a, you know, it's just, you're not going to find it. Uh, a lot of places elsewhere, you'll find a lot of different organizations of people. Some kingdoms, some tribes, some loose conglomerations, groups. And so when the Brits or the French or whoever arrives, they do a pretty good job of, you know, turning these groups against each other, choosing one group and shooting it to the top and taking advantage of their elites. And, you know, all this sort of politicking that becomes a lot more difficult if you, as the leader of a singular kingdom, manage to centralize that power. So, that, that's definitely interesting. <laughs> Dennis hopes his second floor apartment keeps him high enough to avoid the sinking of the Netherlands. I hope so too, buddy. <laughs> One of the biggest reasons Britain was able to conquer India was because there was no strong central authority. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. Strong central authority, um, which of course is sort of a sign of a, a powerful state and often sign of modernization, right? I mean, this was a big aspect of moving towards the modern era um, was a lot of these states centralizing power and identity and all this sort of business. So being centralized really allows you to resist a lot more rather than being split up a hundred as Shad says, hundreds of tiny states and, you know, becomes a lot more easy to be taken advantage of. It gave the king more power to control the local rulers. The concentration of power became a beneficial advantage in the fight against Western colonization. Right. Another important factor might be the transition to Europeanism. In Siam, the royal family set a fashion for admiring Western things. Cars mm -hmm. and other European things were imported. Chula Long Korn enjoyed being photographed in Western clothes, and he sent his sons for European education. Still, there was a brief period of... Con yep, uh, and we've also talked about this, adopting European ways. Once again, it's kind of it's kind of rough if you don't really have an option, <laughs> and you have to do it, but it is a you know, one method to resist European colonization. Um, you know, of course, as we've already mentioned as well, the Japanese are the best example of this, though they maintained a lot of elements of their own culture, but they adopted many elements of European culture, European dress, European government, military, all that sort of stuff, um, which helped them resist the European powers. By the time the Brits came around, the Mughals barely held any land and power in contrast to when the Portuguese came around, which is a big L. Yeah, no, yeah, I mean, I agree, Dennis. We're, we're joking, but yeah, <laughs> I hope people in coastal areas will be okay in the coming years because it's, uh, well, it's going to be rough. It's, uh, it's going to be rough. Concern that may have led to a change of plans, if not for the eventual outcome. Counterintuitive to the presence of Siam as a buffer zone, pretty shortly after the arrival of the European colonists, a war broke out between the French and Siamese. The Pak Nam incident that happened in uh -oh. 1893 can be seen as the culmination of this conflict. Previously, I mean, this is a sort of a classic colonizer move. Um, you know, some incident breaks out and then the Europeans are like, all right, I'm conquering your country now. It's mine. Thank you. <laughs> the French and Siamese had come to an agreement that allowed the French to pass freely all the way up to the Pak Nam Islands. 
and so they decided to do just that. Having already anchored a gunboat at the French embassy in Bangkok, France wanted to send a second gunboat and an aviso up the Chow Freya River to- uh Oh, they're heading for Bangkok. Uh, and to my understanding, Bangkok is not what the uh, Thai people, uh, the people of the region actually call it. I think it has like a much longer and more complicated name for the city. Uh, but, uh, you know, we call it Bangkok. The Mughals were extremely powerful and held off the colonizers. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like using the term gunboat diplomacy. Very popular during this period. Um, gunboat diplomacy, sort of an arm of that sort of European colonialism. Um, though I think of, say, uh, you know, the American approach to Japan, probably one of the best examples of gunboat diplomacy yeah and as light says the longer name is just inconvenient yeah we you know we need to shorten it down a little bit <laughs> to use in common conversation meets with the first ship for some reason the siamese decided that they no longer wish to permit free passage to the french in this instance and uh -oh. instead forbade the French from continuing their journey. Unsure of what to do next, the French commander, Captain Bory, tried to await further instructions from Paris, but no such messages came. The French consul, Auguste Pavy, suggested that the ships anchor at Ko Si Chung temporarily until they received proper advice as to how to continue. He mm. informed Bory of the warning given by the Siamese and hoped that this would be enough to pause the journey and avoid any conflict. Bory, contrarily, was more focused on his need to move forward. Given that the next chunk of his voyage necessitated a high tide, Bory wanted to hurry along his way, regardless of what the Siamese wanted, <laughs> and so, Gaining support from Rear Admiral Edgar Human, Bory chose to go forward. What a collection of names here. Pavi, Captain Bory, Edgar Human. <laughs> also a sort of classic European way. You know, uh, they've told us not to keep moving forward. They don't want us approaching the city. Yes, well, you know, there's the tide to consider and such things. Keep moving forward. <laughs> and ignore Pavi's advice. This, of course, did not sit well with the Siamese. Uh-oh. As night began to set on July the 13th, the French... All right, well, I'm real curious to see what happens here because, like I said, this is one of those moments that would often lead to an independent country being conquered by these uh, European imperialists, you know? Some sort of incident happens, a fight breaks out, and then, in this case, the French or any other nation, European nation, you know, moves their gunboats in and starts starts blasting. So I'm curious to see how they sort of avoided this. Light dunking on the French. Did the sun rise from the west today? French post-Napoleon is the worst. Yeah, look, Light just likes the Napoleonic period. <laughs> After Bernadotte left, he's out. You know, he, he's not into it anymore. <laughs> Bangkok is known as Krong Tep, but it does have a long official name. Uh, and yep, uh, that's a pretty long name. Ugh. In Zod's, because people keep talking about the Mughals in chat, Zod's keeps <laughs> referencing Tamerlane, of course, the video that he wanted us to react to. <laughs> followed high tide and continued on their path toward the Pak Nam Islands. The French were unaware of the fact that the Siamese had already been prepared for their entry, having been waiting in their battle stations. At first, the Siamese would have been unable to see... And Light, Light's trying to defend himself. Hey, I supported Napoleon in 1814, and when he came back in 1815, I was there. Yeah, okay, no one's, no one's buying that, Light. Okay, we know you were holed up in Sweden at the time. You didn't want to get involved. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I agree with you, by the way. I mean, my favorite era of French history is the long 18th century. So, you know, we're talking Louis the 14th, 15th, 16th Revolution, Napoleon. That is, uh, that is the era of French history that I enjoy the most. 
been waiting in their battle stations. At first, the Siamese would have been unable to see the French ships approaching due to heavy rain and low clouds. It wasn't until the rain had let up that night that the Siamese caught sight of the boats as they passed by a lighthouse. For now, there was no action taken. The French ships were not in range of the Siamese guns, and the former was obviously not intending to fight the latter first. But mm. once the gap was closed, the Siamese shot off two blanks to see if the uh -oh. French would heed the warning. Let's no see. response came, and the ships were still moving forward. So the Siamese now fired a real warning shot into the water. Oh. Still, the French ignored. Oh no! Now, the Siamese fired one more live shot to trigger their gunboats to open fire. The uh -oh. French engaged, firing back with their own shots, which- Here we go, I mean, now it's an engagement. We've started. Caused a wave of chaos to wash over the Siamese defenders, with both the fort and gunboats being commanded by newly arrived Danes who spoke not even a lick <laughs> of Siamese. The ability of the Siamese to quickly fire back was hindered. According okay. to one witness, the Danish captains on the Siamese ships ended up having to run back and forth between the bridge and the guns, which they would have to fire themselves. The situation scarcely differed at the fort. Likely due to unorganization and lacking effort by the Siamese, the French were shortly able to pass through, mostly unscathed, and reach Pak Nam. This entire encounter... <laughs> Foreign experts in true Ottoman style. <laughs> That's funny. We brought some foreign experts in. You know, we can't actually understand each other. Some would argue this is an issue. <laughs> it was only through the internal divisions of the Oh my goodness. Yeah, we're still we're still on the Mughals in the chat. Uh, in English, Bangkok is the city of angels. Oh wow. So, Los Angeles as well. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, the great city, the residence of the Emerald Buddha, the impregnable city uh, of God Indra, the grand capital of the world endowed with nine precious gems, the happy city abounding in an enormous royal palace that resembles the heavenly abode where reigns the reincarnated God, a city given by Indra and built by Vishnu Karn. My goodness. What a title. <laughs> what a title. I mean, that's certainly more grand than Los Angeles. Angered the French, especially considering the fact that it was a violation of a prior agreement made by the two sides. The initial punishment given by the French was to establish a blockade of the river after uh -oh. the French ships had departed to head back home. This, unfortunately, had a significantly negative effect on British trade as well, which prompted Ooh. the Brits to put pressure on both sides for negotiations. This was not the first... The, the, okay, interesting. So I was wondering, I thought this would go very badly from this point forward for Siam, for Thailand, but it seems like the Brits are sort of getting involved. Once again, we hit on that, on those intercolonial politics, which can sort of shape the situation. Also, you know, the Brits playing the centrists, Playing defense sitters. Hey, can you guys just get on? We need a compromise position. <laughs> it's time that the French and Siamese had clashed over political disputes, though. Since the arrival of the British and French, more and more pressure was put on Siam, and they started to lose some territories. Oh, no. Earlier on in the previous year, Tensions had started to rise after the French government general of Indochina had sent Auguste Pavi to bring Laos under French authority. Other incidents, such as the expulsion of three French merchants by two different Siamese governors, also sparked an anti-Siamese sentiment back in France, which mm. only... Nothing angers the Brits more than disrupted trade routes. Yeah, the Brits just want their extractive colonial empire to stay alive. That's all they want. They want their trade routes kept open <laughs> so they can keep doing what they're doing. ...we encourage the brewing friction. This would later prompt Pavi to demand that the Siamese evacuate every last military post that they had on... The Brits were just a trading empire, nothing more, nothing less. I mean, I think it was more than a trading empire. <laughs> it was a grand colonial empire. Uh, an empire at sea, a land empire. Uh, it was... And certainly trade was a big part of it, but it was certainly more than a trade empire. 
Uh, I mean, a big part of it, like I said, was the extraction of resources from these different colonies, so uh, certainly more complicated than just a trading empire. <laughs> yeah, trade routes, Tamil kings sweating profusely. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is our area, trade routes. Onto the east of the Mekong River, as he claims that this region truly belongs to Vietnam. As part of this uh -oh. pressure, Pavi sent what would be the first French gunboat anchored in Bangkok. Before that, though, in April, the French sent a military force into the disputed region to seize control. Eventually, the Siamese did agree to give Laos over to the French, which required a new treaty between France and Britain to establish clear borders between French Laos and Upper Myanmar, which was in British hands. It was significantly important for both sides to not only define these borders, but to also ensure that peace could be maintained with the Kingdom of Siam. It remains the case that a buffer territory would be ideal. Upper Myanmar, aka... Like, I, get, I thought it was Burma under British control, and of course not, you know, not, not doing so well in recent years at all, actually. For the British and French colonies, and both sides were dealing with enough of their own problems within the surrounding lands to want to risk Ooh. a war with each other. This it's a sizable chunk of territory. Uh, yeah, and I think the the shores from magma and shad are the appropriate response to that statement. <laughs> no, colonialism is just an added bonus. I mean, first off, bonus is a funny way to describe colonialism. Uh, and then, uh, I don't think it was just an added bonus. <laughs> deal for the British and French colonies, and both sides were dealing with enough of their own problems within the surrounding lands to want to risk a war with each other. This alone could have stopped Thailand from being colonized. Subsequently, the Siamese started to pass sweeping economic, military, and administrative reforms. Oh. This created a new centralization process in Siam, which greatly pleased the West and led to Britain and France. <laughs> of course it did. Of course it did. And this is what I mean. The Europeans were like, ooh, you're adopting our government. Ooh, brilliant. Brilliant. We love it. We love it. You're adopting European ways. Oh, fantastic. They, they love that stuff. They love that stuff. Because they, you know, they have their superiority complex. Um, and, you know, that, that's part of what they did. I'm surprised more of these European colonial armies didn't die by the climate. I mean, look, a lot of these European colonial armies had a real bad time uh, in some of these South Asian countries due to the climate. And, uh, I mean, it's my understanding the British Raj employed basically a lot of local, a lot of Indian soldiers um, instead. Uh, I mean, certainly later in the empire, there were a lot of Indian soldiers under the employ, I guess, of the British Empire. But I think a lot of these European colonial armies definitely did have a bad time due to the climate in many of these countries. Climate, disease, that sort of stuff. It's reiterating their neutral stance and insisting they had no plans of occupying, colonizing, or in any other way taking over the territory of Siam. By 1910, a series of updated treaties that has... Uh, Napoleon in Italy, uh, part four is out tomorrow. Uh, that'll be released tomorrow. Uh, I filmed it yesterday, uh, and so that reaction will be out tomorrow. Establish the borders of modern day Thailand. That same oh. year, King Chula Longkorn died and was succeeded by his son, King Rama VI, who had been educated at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. <laughs> That's not even related, Shad. When's the Gallienus reaction dropping? No. Uh, the one that we're doing after... So, I mean, we've got stuff to do after Alexander, but the next Roman history series is um, Germanicus. That's what we have next. Uh, not Gallienus. Uh, I know Gallienus is your fave. Um, but I'm trying to think... Um, God, I'm trying to think my schedule. It's like, you know, we've got Napoleon in Egypt. And then... Uh, yeah, Avenging Varus by Invicta, I think. 
I think it was by Invicta. I don't remember. That should be uh, after our we finished the Napoleon in Egypt series. Uh, Gallienus is not on the schedule. Maybe he will be at one point, but I've got so much other stuff to do, but he's not yet on the schedule. Same year, King Chula Longkorn died and was succeeded by his son, King Rama VI, who had been educated at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst and the University of Oxford, which helped hmm. contribute to the leadership's westernization. New education systems and schools were opened. The Gregorian calendar was adopted, and even societal changes were encouraged in order to better match the West. Following a brief failed palace revolt in which a group of young military officers attempted to overthrow the king in favor of a more westernized institution, the First World War broke out. Oh. Likely to keep the peace with the West, Siam declared war on Germany and Austria-Hungary, and its <laughs> role in the war would eventually earn its place in the Peace Conference of Versailles. Okay, and now we've sort of reached the point where, <laughs> you know, uh, not to say that European colonization efforts, like, halted at this point, but, you know, you're Thailand, you're independent, you know, you've made it to the First World War, if you've made it this far, you can probably make it past colonization, you know? I'm sorry, but I hope Epic History TV do Napoleon in Egypt, because the one you were reacting to, Ethan, was so bad. Um, I mean, I do hope Epic History TV does Napoleon in Egypt. I think that would be great. But once again, the extra history Napoleon in Egypt, I've only watched the first two episodes, so I haven't watched the whole thing. Um, so I can't judge the whole thing. All I can say is what I've seen wasn't that bad. Maybe the rest of it is terrible. What I've seen wasn't too bad. The first two episodes. Uh, Thailand held out long enough for European dominance to decline. Yeah, I mean, that's basically it, Light, you know? Uh, that's what... If you're a country that resists imperialism, you basically just held out long enough for the European powers to enter decline. So, I mean, we're basically talking about well, I think if you made it to this point, you're going to make it that far. But it's really, you know, post-World War II, the French and British colonial empires collapse. Uh, everything, you know, uh, they become far less important as global power players as, you know, we enter the, uh, you know, the Cold War era. So, yeah. Okay, Zods, wh why? Well... I don't want you to spoil anything, but whenever I release the reactions to Extra History's Napoleon in Egypt videos, uh, which will be coming in the next, like, week or so, uh, feel free to comment below them, like, what you have problems with. You know, tell me what is so bad about them. Because, um, you know, I haven't gotten to most of them yet, so I'm, I'm curious to see. Because people are acting like they're the worst thing in the world. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, I don't know. The first two episodes didn't seem that bad, but maybe the rest of it's totally awful. This new level of relevance on the global stage greatly protected Siam from the potential risk that they faced in the past from Western colonization. As Siam yeah. now moved towards a constitutional monarchy and eventually became Thailand in 1939, the threat of any Western invasion was essentially non-existent. Thailand joined the Axis powers to avoid Japanese colonization. Oh, wow. But almost every map shows them under Japanese control. Interesting. That's an interesting turn of events. But I guess that doesn't... I mean, if you're in that region at that time, basically you have the Jap the growing Japanese empire to contend with. So you got a couple of options <laughs> if you want to resist or defend yourself from that growing Japanese empire. I suppose one of which is joining the Axis and technically being an ally of Japan's. Due to a combination of geography, resistance, and assimilation, the Siamese proved to Britain, France, and any other colonial powers that it was best for everyone that they remain free and uncolonized. Thanks mm. to the position of the French and British on either side and the policies under the later Siamese kings, Thailand managed to escape colonization. Yeah. Well, there you go. 
That is how Thailand avoided colonization. Why wasn't Thailand colonized? We have our answer. Some combination of intercolonial politics between France and Britain and policies specifically implemented by the leaders of the country. Um, there you go. Add that to the list. You know, we always talk about Ethiopia and how Ethiopia resisted colonization. Now we have Thailand as another example. That was a good video. Uh, good suggestion from Light. I enjoyed that one. Oh, it was very interesting. You know, something that I, I truly knew virtually nothing about. Um, so that was good. All right. We're done with our reactions today. Uh, as we always do with these live streams, if we want to chat for a couple of minutes about any sort of historical topics, if you want to bring anything up, feel free. Um, but we are done with the reactions for this stream. We're about... Uh, like three and a half hours in, so that, that's fairly standard for us. Finland also joined the Axis for a while. Well, yeah, Finland, you have some countries that have a fairly interesting World War II experience, a little different from what we usually think about. Of course, you have, you know, the, the Winter War, Finland and the Soviet Union, and, you know, all that sort of business. It was good, but the Tamerlane vid would have been ten times better, says Zods. My goodness. Uh, ten times? I don't know if it would have been ten times better. That is quite the claim. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll get the chance to do the Tamerlane video at another point. You know, I mean, look, uh, I, I select specific videos, of course, for the live stream, but in most of the live streams we do we get an opportunity at the end to vote on what our uh, next reaction will be. And so, hey, if you suggest it again next time, maybe it'll win. Zod's is a Tamerlane fanboy. Yeah, this is true. Are you thinking of reacting to a whole series on stream like you did with Catherine? Uh, yeah. I mean, I enjoy those. You know, uh, I don't have anything specific planned for the next stream, but I am always looking for people's suggestions. And, uh, yeah, I, I think I'd be totally willing to do another series on stream uh, like I did with Catherine. Uh, and then, who set the worst precedents, Marius or Sulla? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't really love. I don't really like Sulla. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> I mean, it was a pretty important moment in Roman history. I'm am not a Sulla fan. Um, who set the worst precedents? I don't know. What do you think, Light? Set some, I think they, yeah, but some bad precedents were set overall, you know? I mean, we look at the sort of, well, the social war and the, you know, uh, change of the, the Republic and some of these bad precedents being set and, you know, just a lot of not great stuff. Sulla did the prescriptions, that tips the balance for me. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, I definitely have a more negative perspective on Sulla. Uh, way more negative. Uh, I would really like to do a Marius and Sulla reaction. I mean, I think someone, it might have been Light, recommended a couple of videos that I think would be good for stream, actually. A couple of videos. I'm trying to remember where I saved them. But a couple of videos on that time period, sort of Roman Republican history, Marius and Sulla. Um... So I think those would be good for a live stream. You know, we could do a couple of those videos because, you know, we do a lot of Roman history on the channel, but on YouTube, there's a lot of interest in Roman history on YouTube, but so much attention gets absorbed by Caesar. So much. And whatever attention isn't absorbed by Caesar, 
usually goes to sort of the late Republican, early Empire period, maybe to Augustus, you know, maybe some of those characters, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, which is fine. I enjoy all of that. But I do sometimes wish there was a little more attention to uh, the rest of Roman history, you know, especially, you know, that sort of era of the Republic, that like hundred years where we start seeing some of these interesting precedents being set. I'll put it that way. So I think they would be fun to do for a live stream. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to repost those videos. I think I also remembered where I where I put them. So I, I'm going to do a live stream with those. And then, I'm, like I said earlier, I also want to do a, a U.S. President's tier list live stream. So in terms of live streams I have planned, I don't have the dates. But, um, you know, I want to do a live stream on Sulla uh, and Marius in that period, and then a live stream on U.S. presidents, and then, um, and Shad, you asked about would I be willing to do another series on stream? I would. I don't know if you have anything particular you want to suggest, um, but uh, yeah, I, I definitely want to do more of those in the future. And yeah, I mean, yeah, the late Republic is the best documented part of the Republic's history. Sure, it is. But I mean, let's be honest, Light. I don't, I mean, that's part of why it's the most talked about, but it's just also the most popular. People love the characters and Caesar. It's become very popular in pop culture and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I mean, that that's definitely a part of it. Definitely. Uh, Zods will be putting Timur content in the Discord. Fair enough. <laughs> Millard Fillmore, Optimus Princeps. What a, what a reference. No one expected the Millard Fillmore reference. God damn. The Roman Kingdom is underrated. Yeah, well, that's even less talked about than Sulla and Marius. <laughs> You're telling me you wouldn't want to learn about a king magically being pulled into a storm by a god. Can we at least watch the Epic History TV ranking of the U.S. presidents so I can remember who they... Um, good question. That's not a bad idea, but then I, I know if we, like, if we did a stream where we do that Epic History TV video and the tier list, like, it would take us way longer to do it. Um, I would like to do that Epic History TV U.S. presidents video at some point. I think it sounds fun. Um... But I feel like uh, if we're going to do a U.S. President's tier list, then we're probably better off just doing the tier list. I know some U.S. history, contrary to what you might believe. Oh, really light. I didn't, uh, I didn't know that. I mean, you're sort of, uh, you know, you know a lot about Napoleon and you know a lot about Rome. <laughs> That's what I know. <laughs> light thrives under my approval. <laughs> What, uh, do you have a specific era of U.S. history that you know, uh, about, or just some general U.S. history knowledge? Obviously for me, like, you know, I moved to the United States as a child, so a lot of my education as a kid, like, you know, high school, middle school, and elementary school was a lot about U.S. history, so I know it from that, and then sort of my... My interest, my main interest in history, you know, uh, sort of the Enlightenment, transatlantic exchange of ideas, American and French revolutions, you know, a lot of that touches on the early United States and colonial America as well. So that's what I know about. Shad knows mostly the Civil War in the 1900s. Yeah, there's a lot of Civil War stuff on YouTube. That's fairly popular, which isn't really my area of expertise. And then light... Political history of the U.S. is the most interesting for me. I mean, I love political history in general, so I agree. <laughs> I love political history, American political history. Um, but also some history of the Supreme Court. Okay, that's pretty niche, you know. Uh, that, that's a pretty niche pick, but I think uh, that's a fascinating one. You know, Supreme Court, very important institution. Uh, and real, yeah, real important institution, uh, especially considering... It's uh, unaccountability. 
I think I know more about American history than my own country's history. Uh, for, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people know uh, more about other countries than their own magma, so that's fair. Uh, you're intelligent, though, so your British genes must be shining through. Uh, I don't know if that's it. <laughs> I don't know if that's it. Marbury versus Madison. Yeah, there was a lot of fascinating SCOTUS decisions, um, but if you talk about the most important SCOTUS decision, it's obviously Marbury versus Madison, because without Marbury versus Madison, <laughs> a lot of those other important Supreme Court decisions don't happen. You know, the and, and you're exactly like, right, like... Uh, judicial review, frankly, has been so important since that point and remains extremely important today. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's a fascinating institution. I mean, we saw the, uh, of course, the recent repeal of Roe v. Wade, which had massive implications for the whole country, right? And that, that was done by the Supreme Court. And of course, the initial Roe v. Wade Supreme Court as well. So, real interesting. Uh, yeah, and Shad's pointing out that that moment uh, from Andrew Jackson, where the Supreme Court had ruled against the, uh, you know, Indian removal, and you're exactly right, Andrew Jackson, to paraphrase, said something along the lines of, they've made their decision, now let's see them enforce it, you know, because, of course, the uh, Supreme Court doesn't really have a whole lot of enforcement mechanisms, unlike the president, who absolutely does have enforcement mechanisms, now, that is very unconstitutional and sort of anathema <laughs> to the United States system of checks and balances, but uh, Andrew Jackson was just that kind of guy. He, he did not mind flouting uh, constitutionality or, you know, how the system is supposed to work. Hmm. But yeah, we'll get, a, we'll get a chance to talk about a lot of this during our... Uh, presidential tier list, which I think will be a lot of fun. Um, you know, we'll get a chance, because we don't do much U.S. history on the channel, but, you know, we will, uh, you know, we'll get a chance to talk about a lot of that during the tier list. Isn't it ironic, Jackson? Yeah, it's very, it's very ironic. Why is he on the bill? Well, it's, uh... I mean, I don't know exactly how the decision is made, but, you know, we have a collection of important characters from our history on our bills, not exclusively presidents. Good old Benjamin Franklin is on the $100 bill. Andrew Jackson's on the $20 bill. Of course, there's a lot of controversy around that because Andrew Jackson was a controversial figure at the time, and he's controversial today. And so uh, a lot of people want to take Andrew Jackson off the $20 bill. Of course, Andrew Jackson was opposed to central banking, um, you know, likes the decentralized system and specie. So, you know, maybe if you asked him, he wouldn't want to be on the $20 bill either. A lot of people want to put, I think the replacement, suggested replacement is Harriet Tubman put on the $20 bill, um, which, you know, I think there's a lot of people you could choose. But yeah, it is definitely ironic that Andrew Jackson's on the $20 bill. Seems unnecessary. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Our, our bills have a collection of important American figures, mostly but not exclusively presidents on them. So it's kind of just how it works. I think, uh, I mean, it's not the biggest deal to me, but I would be fine with taking him off the bill. <laughs> but I know that would ignite a absolute political firestorm if the government actually moved to make that happen. It would be crazy. Uh, yep, Panic of 1817. Uh, Ethan on the $20 bill petition. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I mean, you know, sort of in the early Republican period of American history, one of the big questions was about central banking, national finance. Uh, of course, you know, good old Alexander Hamilton is sort of the, the father of that. Um, nowadays, central banking is so accepted around the world. Uh, it's just an element of modern economics uh, that is relatively well accepted, but, you know, super controversial at the time. You had a lot of arguments back and forth. Uh, and Andrew Jackson was very much opposed. You know, I mean, during the, you know, the earliest period, that debate is best characterized by Hamilton versus someone like Jefferson, right? 
Everyone loves their tariff income. <laughs> no, no need for that pesky income tax. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's another question. That I mean, the income tax is really accepted today, of course, but uh, at the time it was kind of controversial. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of like having a collection of different figures on your bills. You know what I mean? I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, uh, you know, the Bank of England bills, they just have the, the monarch, the queen. I guess soon it will be the king. I don't know if they've changed it yet. But if you look at, like, Bank of Scotland bills, it's a collection of different characters from Scottish history. So um, I, I like the idea of having different... Uh, historical figures on different denominations. I know that it can get controversial and, oh, who do you pick? And, oh, what if, you know, our idea of them changes? Sure, but I don't know. I think it's sort of a good, uh, you know, reminds people of the history, sort of a bit of a nation-building exercise. Uh, I think it's a good thing to have a couple of different characters on your bills. You know, don't give all the shine to one individual. Yeah, Ethan finally gets to discuss U.S. history, yeah. Well, whenever we do that uh, presidential tier list live stream, that'll be good. We have Dog Hammerskjold, something like that. <laughs> the former U.N. Secretary General that was shot down over the Congo on the uh, 60, well, you've written $60 bill. Uh, on our highest denomination bill. Yeah, I mean, our highest denomination is famously, you know, the Benjamin, the $100 bill, Benjamin Franklin. Which, that's pretty cool. I mean, a lot of people like Benjamin Franklin, you know? <laughs> Not a president, but uh, pretty good. It should be up to a vote. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to voting on it, but, you know, you have to set... You have to set the standard of the vote in the first place. You know what I mean? You have to have options to vote on. So it's kind of difficult, I think, to make the process super democratic because it is kind of a bureaucratic decision, you know? Um, but, I mean, yeah, if I would be fine with having, like, a, a vote on who's on the bill. I don't, I don't think it's really that important, but uh, I think that's a fine way to decide it. You know, like if, for example, we ended up in a position where it's like, okay, should we replace Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill with Harriet Tubman or whoever else, and you put it up to a vote? Like, yeah, that's cool. Um, though, of course, that, you know, we don't have those sort of federal referendums in the U.S., so it would have to be like a vote of Congress, which I think is how it would be decided. He first got rid of 500 and 1,000 rupee bills some years ago and replaced them with 500 and 2,000 ones. Now he's banned the 2,000 notes. <laughs> yeah. And we all know Congress gets stuff done. Yeah, so... Man, this is one of those things where... I mean, Congress can't even get to the important issues. Do you think we're going to get to changing the $20 bill? I don't think so. I really don't think so. Plus, like I said, it would ignite an absolute political firestorm. I mean, that would be the next big uh, culture war issue. You can already imagine it. You can already imagine it. You know, the the people who support keeping Jackson on the bill, oh, they're trying to erase history. They're trying to destroy our history and our culture. I can't believe they'd do this. I mean, it would be a mess. It would be a total mess. Like, like any political issue in America these days. It always turns into a culture war issue. Keeps yelling is to get rid of black money since most of it is in high denominations and cash. Mm. Dangerous. Hmm. All right. Yeah, sounds like uh, sounds like Shad's experiencing some currency complications in India. Uh, at the very least, you know, our currencies 
well, I mean, of course, in America, we have the, the U.S. dollar, sort of the global reserve currency. <laughs> so it's usually pretty stable compared to a lot of other currencies around the world, which is good for us, I guess. Yeah, the Romans famously had no issues with currency. Famously. That, was, that wasn't one of the big issues that they had to deal with throughout the course of their empire. Famously. <laughs> Not a parliament building. A new house for Supreme Leader Modi. My goodness. Y'all have got some interesting politics going on in India. <laughs> you know, some interesting uh, nationalist politics. I'll put it that way. You know, we've, we've got some things in common. But a, a different situation, of course. Um, all right, I think we're gonna bring this live stream to an end. Uh, we did uh, we did some good videos. We did uh, you know how did the Abbasid Caliphate collapse? That was an interesting one. Then we did who are the Tamil people, uh, which I actually really enjoyed. You know uh, I think it uh, exceeded my expectations. Really interesting stuff. Um, you know interesting history, culture, some good stuff. And then we ended uh, with. Why wasn't Thailand colonized? Another topic that I didn't know much about or anything about, really. So it was good to learn about. Um, stay tuned for the... Tomorrow will be the new Napoleon in Italy video by Epic History TV. So that's a lot of fun. It was a great time filming it. Uh, some really interesting stuff in there. And then stay tuned for our U.S. presidential tier list live stream. And a live stream, I think, basically on Marius and Sulla in that era think that would be a, a fun time so yeah thanks for stopping by everybody i hope you all had a good time good recommendations uh and i will see you guys either next time we stream or in the discord if you haven't joined the discord do that it's a it's a fun place